Okay, members, you're very welcome to this session of the Education Committee. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to add all members to the spotlight and to keep them there for the next four agenda items? Uh, members aware of any apologies? Uh, no, I think Daniel will join us later. Okay, thanks, Clerk. Uh, in terms of Chairperson's business, um, can I ask the Clerk to speak to the information we've received with regards to the Department of Education business plan? Sorry, Chairperson, I'm just texting to tell them. Oh, right. Sorry, I, can, I can advise members that the Department has issued a business plan for 2020 2021, and it seems that following restart in schools, the Department of Education has restarted um, other policy development. Um, Clark, are you OK to speak to yes. some of those key areas? Thanks, Chairperson. Thank you. Yeah, members, so this is what I'd been waiting for, um, was that uh, a lot of things in the Department stopped. Uh, at the time of lockdown, as members would expect, and it seems like they're starting up again. So their business plan indicates that in the autumn of 2020, so any time about now, they will um, move forward with the SEN Code of Practice um, consultations, that's the new SEN Code of Practice, uh, the development of a newcomer policy, a looked after children's strategy, um, the area planning and development proposal process will restart, there will be an evaluation of shared education, and uh, the relaunch of capital procurement at Struhl. So there are things like the, um, uh, I think they're going to let the contract, was it for the pitch, and there's like a road that has to be built. So things are moving there. In January 2021, they are planning on the commencement of anti-bullying legislation. So this was the uh, Addressing Bullying in Schools Act, which was passed some years ago and never commenced. So that's their plan. And in March 2021, they indicate they'll bring forward a childcare strategy and a new approach to school inspection. And if I've read the business plan correctly, it appears to indicate that school inspections would be recommencing, subject to agreement, from March 2021. So, um, again, so quite a few things happening, Chairperson, and I imagine members will then want to revisit their forward work programme, and this will influence our planning session, which will take before Halloween. Okay, thank you, Clerk. Chair, Clark. Clark. Yeah, just... Deputy Chair, Clark. Uh, Clerk, um, the anti-bullying, is that full Im implementation? It says commencement, so uh, it's just like it's one line. I don't know I is the answer. So, as you say, it's yeah. been around the houses. Robbie. Chair. Robbie Butler. Yeah, um, two things. Um, just pick up on Karen's piece in the Anti-Bullying Act 2016. I think a working group had been established at that time um, and had embarked on a piece of work with regard to it. Um, it would be important that any work that was established wasn't lost um, and that that still forms part um, of the consultation and ongoing engagement and so on. Um, so if that was something we could just even put down is just to ask the question um, with regard to any working group that had previously been established. To, to look at it, uh, I think in 2016, um, and if it was still the, I think it had been agreed at the time that that would be the methodology used, um, just to, to, to ensure that that is still the case. So we, the committee wants to write the DE just to determine the where they are with the working group on the underlying yeah, where they are work, with the working group and, and the plan for consultation. Not because um, I'm, I'm really keen on the on the anti-bullying piece because of the link between poor mental health and well-being and outcomes, um, and and that, that that lifelong sort of impact that it has. So. And then, obviously, the, the role that teachers and heads have to play in this, it's, it's, it's a really complicated, it's a necessary piece, but it needs to be right, because it's a difficult one uh, to deal with. And just in terms of the area planning then, obviously, COVID has really put the brakes on some schools' development plans uh, and the area planning piece. And many, a number of members have been in touch with the minister with regard to some particular issues. So I think that's actually really important um, at the moment. Um, because it's all tied in uh, with regard to schools development and, and all of the other uh, educational pieces. So, just think in terms of a priority, maybe for us. So, okay, yep. Yeah. Karen, again. go ahead. Was, was there any mention of the 14 to 19 year old strategy? Um, as, as members will recall, we were just about to get a briefing on that. Um, I'll speak to the member after the meeting about that. They, they did actually, if you recall, there was a paper. I think it would be fair to say progress was limited at that point. My expectation would be that I don't know what my expectations are. I don't recall anything in the um, business plan about that, but I may be wrong. I may be wrong. I'll come back to the Thank member. You. Okay. Uh, Justin, do you want to come in? Is that a hand raised or a stray hand raised? No problem. Um, any other members? Yeah, Catherine Kelly. 
here, just in relation to the, the plans for the child care strategy that we published in 2021, is that, does that mean like full, full implementation or do we have any more detail than that? Because in recent days, it seems that, you know, there wasn't a lot of information um, or a timeline that could even be given on it. Um, and I'm talking in reference to our um, all-party group meeting on, on Monday morning. Yep. Thanks for raising that, Catherine. Clark, do you know which page the uh, childcare strategy reference is on? Uh, yes, I think. Hold on. Um, childcare. Oh, yeah, it's at page 88 of your packs. I think there's also a reference in there somewhere to an action plan. Yes, yeah, a strategy action plan developed by March, subject to um, various things. So that's page 88 of your packs. It is there. Um, and there was something in Assembly written questions I seem to remember about childcare and about how the, uh, there was going to be consideration to things other than three to fours, mm -hmm. that there were other age groups mm -hmm. that they were looking at. Perhaps it was in response to Ms Mullen's okay. question. So, yeah, so just, just to repeat that, Clark, then, the, uh, on page 88 of our packs, which is corporate goal three of the business plan, at strategic objective number seven, performance measure is the executive childcare strategy published by March 2021, subject to budget and executive approval. A strategy action plan developed by March 2021, subject to confirmation of staffing resources and budget, performance measures and report cards developed for each strategic action. Um, you're right, Catherine, that's a bit more detail than we've been given in recent days and we'd need reflection. I imagine a lot of people in the childcare sector would like to see that childcare strategy published before March, but um, there is a commitment to conduct an innovation lab engagement with the childcare sector that may take um, some time prior to March 2021, but that, that is useful information. Um, Clark, I note that the, sorry, any other members want to ask a question or comment on business plan before I round up? Nope. Okay. Uh, Clark, I note there is reference to transformation and the independent review um, of education and business plan acknowledges that new decade, new approach agreed that the executive will establish an external independent review of education with a focus on securing greater efficiency and delivery costs, raising standards, access to the curriculum and the prospects of moving towards a single education system. Um, the, the text of the business plan says that work to commence the independent review has been temporarily suspended in light of COVID-19 pandemic and the redeployment of resources to meet its challenges. The department remains committed to delivering the review and will recommence the review of education once the resources allocated to the COVID-19 pandemic are available for redeployment. Is there anywhere in the corporate goals section where it gives more detail in terms of a time scale for that? Because that is concerningly vague. Um, I think uh, at page 69, or maybe that, is that where you're reading? That is, yeah. Uh, there, there's somewhere else I've read, because um, I, I seem to remember the minister, I thought he said when he addressed the ad hoc committee that something might be brought forward on this around on the independent review um, in September, but I think a different time scale appears to be given here that it's later, it might be around about, might be making, I think it might be around January, maybe it's yeah, as late as that. In the corporate goals under transforming the education system, it just says to review and transform the education system. Um, I think there's there's also a piece in there about okay. um, they're comparing the the transformation program has been around for about eighteen months. The independent review came out of the um, the latest uh, well, the new DNA, um, and there's a piece in there about comparing the two uh, and seeing how one sort of overlaps with the other. Um, so because the transformation program was really about seems to be about money and it was about you know services making services better whereas the independent review that was something different it was that as well but it was it was wider and I thought bigger richer um, than that um, so there's a piece around the two um, how they're going to overlap with each other so members you have the minister on the 7th of October I know he's really there to talk about restart but I imagine members will ask him a little bit about um, the business plan yeah can we can, members contend for us to write to the minister and ask when um, the 
independent review of education or work on the independent review of education will be recommenced and when that review will be commenced. Yep. Members content? Yep, agreed. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, one other piece of chairperson's business, Clark. Um, can I just uh, draw members' attention to the consultation on the cross departmental COVID 19 vulnerable children and young people's plan? Um, that opened on the 18th of September and will close on the 13th of November. Uh, I think members will remember, you know, particularly during uh, the first lockdown, that there was um, significant concern with regards to how vulnerable children who routinely access a wide range of therapies via special schools were uh, being able to access that support from home or, as it turns out in many cases, not access that. Um, and indeed, a number of members have raised um, concern about at-risk children as well. So that is a cross-departmental uh, COVID-19 vulnerable children and young people's plan consultation led by the Department of Health. I must admit the way that plan was being referred to in previous dispatches suggested to me that it would have been in place um, uh, well before now, but the consultation has opened. Um, if members want to engage with that or um, consider receiving a briefing on that uh, plan in due course, members content? Yeah. Okay. I think, uh, Chair, I, I would, Chair, uh, Perhaps a, a briefing on it would be useful. I think at some stage. I mean, I'll, I'll chair whenever it fits into the. Yep. I, I, I would support that, Robin. Yeah, I think we should get a briefing in relation to that plan. As I said, I think we'd hope that that would be in place before now. Um, is that is that from the from health officials? Is it from health and education officials, Clark? So I think um, the committee had written to um, DOH. Uh, following some commentary from officials about vulnerable children and you know, who was in the driving seat, who was responsible, uh, seeking uh, uh, an explanation and possibly an oral briefing on this very question. Yeah. So maybe this is an opportunity that uh, when that consultation closes, that perhaps DOH, DE and EA officials could come along Tell us what the feedback is. Explain what the plan is going to be. Tell us about the feedback and, and the way forward. Uh, and that what we, the committee's interest would be the education bits of that cross-sectoral plan. So if you look at the, uh, the document, if you look at the, uh, there's, a, there's a link uh, online. Um, there's, um, as the chair has indicated, there's a f quite a few things for, for education in there, uh, but most of it actually isn't. It's about other stuff. Um, but I think maybe the committee's interest will be the education bits so we can get a briefing with all of those officials together. Yeah, I watched that agree, and that's a good summary. Uh, Peter, I, mean, I think... We'd want to be sure that there's very much a joined up this within the whole thing. That the uh, and primary to the education is the health of the child. So yeah. Agreed. Okay. Okay, members agreed. Agreed. Okay, Clark, uh, draft minutes then, yep. Uh, can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of sixteenth of September at page forty five of your packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and active record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item seven then is correspondence. Clark, do you want to take this now or do you want to move shall to we, our next Shall we go item? to our briefing? Yeah, yeah, let's go to our briefing. We'll take that after then, that okay? Lovely. Okay. Um, Agenda item eight then, Clark. All right. Yep, yes, please. Yep. Our post-primary transfer briefing from the Department of Education and the Education Authority. Can I refer members to your packs, which include a cover note from the clerk at page 123, information relating to a ministerial direction on the delay in post-primary uh, transfer tests at page 132, previous related correspondence from the committee at page 154, an assembly research summary paper on post-primary transfer, page 160. Current DEEA post-primary transfer guides for schools and parents at page 190. And previous papers from AQE, PPTC and the Children's Commission are at pages 208 to 215. Um, Clark, do you want to speak to that briefly in terms of Hansard? Um, Sorry, just to advise yeah. that the uh, briefing will be reported by Hans Arden. If I could ask uh, Assembly Broadcasting to add our witnesses uh, to the spotlight. They possibly can. Here they go. They're just removing members and adding witnesses. Okay, thank there you. There they are. There they are. Okay, can I welcome then 
Uh, this is Janice Scallon, the Director of Sustainable Schools Policy and Planning at the Department of Education. Mr. Scott Harbinson, Head of School Admission Team, Department of Education. Mr. Sam Dempster, Head of Curriculum and Assessment Team, Department of Education. And Mr. Dale Hanna, Director, Acting Operations and Estates Education Authority. So we're missing somebody? Dale? So are we missing Dale? Are we missing Dale? Okay, why don't you start? Yeah. Now, please go okay. On. By by way of welcome, um, can I say that at the committee meeting on the second of September, members asked the Department of Education and Education Authority officials to explain the new post-primary transfer timetable and to set out the new additional costs. Officials were unable to do this at that time. Uh, part of the reasoning cited was that unregulated transfer tests are not the department or EA's responsibility. Yet we now find on the department's website an equality screening document relating to a possible ministerial direction made under Article 101 and apparently requiring the Education Authority to revise post-primary transfer arrangements. So can, in your course of your comments, um, officials, can you please explain to the Committee for Education um, what is the new plan for post-primary transfer and why we have not heard this information to date? The witnesses will have up to 10 to 15 minutes to make an opening statement. Um, can I just check? Yeah, I think I see Dale there, Clark, now. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> hand over to officials for their opening statement. Tom Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to appear this morning for committee. It may be useful if I commence by providing a succinct explanation of the respective roles and responsibilities of each of the stakeholders involved in the process of transfer from primary to post-primary education. The governing legislation, the Education Northern Ireland Order 1997, provides the Department of Education with the power to set an admissions number for every school. That is the number of children a school must admit if it's oversubscribed with applications. The department may also vary this number and uses this power by way of the temporary variations process, which allows an increased intake at a school where there's a need for additional places. The department may also publish guidance on the admissions process, which the Education Authority and individual boards of governors must have regard to. Individual boards of governors are responsible for setting admissions criteria and where the school is oversubscribed with applications, applying the criteria to select children for admission. While, as already indicated, boards of governors must have regard to the department's guidance, the content of the criteria are solely a matter for governors. Those post-primary schools that make use of academic selection, source tests provided by the Association for Quality Education, AQE Limited, and the Post-Primary Transfer Consortium, PPTC. These bodies are independent of the department and the department has no role in organising, scheduling or the content of the tests. The Education Authority, meanwhile, is responsible for ensuring parents can express their preferences for the schools they wish their children to attend and if a child has been unsuccessful in its application to appeal the decision of a Board of Governors to refuse their child admission. The process of transfer therefore operates successfully through the combined efforts of the department, our colleagues in the Education Authority, individual boards of governors and by extension the entrance test providers. The committee will be aware that the test providers announced on the 2nd of September 2020 that they would change the dates of their tests for Transfer 21. AQE Limited has announced dates of the 9th, 16th and 23rd of January 21 for its tests, while the PPTC assessment will operate on the 30th of January 21, with its supplementary test on the 6th of February 21. This is of course later than usual, as the tests are normally completed by the end of November or start of December. The committee will also be aware that these decisions were taken in the context of a legal challenge to the timing of the tests. Over a number of weeks, the department engaged with the Education Authority to ascertain whether a delay to the entrance test and, as a result, a delay to the issue of results could be facilitated within an overall timetable. The department's focus is to ensure that the admissions process is capable of operating successfully for all children, 
regardless of whether or not they sit tests. It would be useful to clarify at this stage that the department considers a successful admissions process to be one that allows all stages of the process, from the nomination of preferences by parents to the selection of applicants by schools and the hearing of all admissions appeals, to be completed in advance of September 2021. The outcome of this engagement was that it's possible for an admissions process to operate successfully even when test dates are in January 21. <coughs> On foot of the test provider's decisions of the 2nd of September to operate tests in January 21, the department has engaged again with colleagues in the Education Authority in relation to the timetable for Transfer 21 and what pressures may emerge in ensuring it's successfully delivered. A timetable is currently being finalised and subject to ministerial clearance will be issued in the coming days. The timetable will be affected by the test provider's delays in operating tests and issuing results and will see a shorter window between the submission of applications and their consideration by first preference schools. This reduction will be facilitated by the introduction of an online school application process for post-primary admissions, building on the successful implementation of online admissions at preschool and primary level in the past two years. It's important to say here that the online process will not just be of benefit now, but for many years to come. In relation to additional costs associated with the 2021 timetable, engagement is ongoing to ascertain what costs might arise and as this work is not completed, I'm unable to advise on what additional costs may crystallise. However, I can advise that consideration is being given to a number of key areas. These relate to the rollout of an online portal for school applications, the management of special circumstances applications within the system, the admissions appeals process, and the transfer of information from test providers to the Education Authority. Transfer 2021 will see a continuation of the pattern of recent years where there has been a significant increase in the size of the cohort transferring to post-primary education. By 2022, we estimate that the competitive admissions process, that is the process for children who do not have a statement of special educational needs, will see over 3,000 more children transferring to post-primary education than transferred in 2015. In order to anticipate demand on places, the department has already allocated 361 year eight places across 21 schools for September 21 admission. These places were allocated following an exercise that identified anticipated pressures and invited applications from schools that wish to be considered for additional places. These places do not represent the totality of additional places that will be required and the temporary variation process will be available to cater for localised pressures. In both 2019 and 2020, over 1,000 additional year eight places were allocated to schools to cater for demand, and we expect a similar number of additional places to be provided in 2021. Jan, in conclusion... Sorry, sorry to cut across you very briefly. Could you just repeat that very quickly in terms of the September 21 um, places numbers? Uh, yes. yes. Um, in terms of the numbers transferring in 21, or yes. just what I've just said? I think, I think um, you say numbers transferring allocated. and then the number of additional places? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, in terms of de anticipating demand, the department has already allocated 361 additional year eight places across 21 schools for September 21 admission. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, in conclusion, I wish to highlight one more very important group of stakeholders involved in the process of transfer, and that is the children who will be moving to post-primary education next year and their parents and guardians. I can assure the committee that the interests of children and their families are central to the decisions we are now making about Transfer 21, although I do acknowledge that the decisions of the test providers to move the test to January 21 has not been met with universal approval. I would like to take this opportunity, however, to highlight the important role that parents can play in securing a place at a school of their preference for their child. The department strongly recommends that parents should nominate at least four schools on their child's application, at least one of which should be a non-grammar school. Unfortunately, 
many of the children who are unplaced when placement letters issue had only one or two preferences listed on their application form. In nominating sufficient and realistic preferences, parents can maximise the likelihood of securing a place for their child at a school of their preference. I would be happy to answer any questions the committee might have, and it may be useful if I explain at this point that my colleague Sam Dempster, to my right, uh, Head of Curriculum and Assessment Team in the Department, has policy responsibility for academic selection and should therefore be able to assist with questions around the testing process. I'm also joined remotely by Dale Hanna, Director of Operations and Estates in the Education Authority, who should be able to assist with questions around the admissions process and to my left, Scott Harbinson, Head of School Admissions Team, who'll have the detail in terms of departmental information on Transfer 21. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for your initial briefing, and I welcome the encouragement that you've given to parents to um, inform themselves about the extremely complex process that they have in front of them. In addition to listing a number of preferences, they also need to work extremely hard to understand the nature of the criteria at each of those schools. As you'll be aware, some non-selective uh, schools require um, you to place that school as first choice in order to be eligible um, or, or likely to gain a place at that school. So it, it's an extremely complex process um, and encouraging to hear the Department of Education um, making an attempt to explain it to parents uh, and children and young people and maybe there's a bit more work to do in, in that regard. Um, the, the information that you've provided us with today is not particularly um, new or additional to information that we've already received so it, you, you still can't give us a timetable for post-primary transfer arrangements for the next academic year? What I can advise, Chair, is that we've received the timetable in the department, so the Education Authority have furnished us with the timetable in the last 48 hours, and it's under consideration by ourselves in the department. It's still subject to ministerial clearance, so I would expect that the timetable will issue imminently. Okay, so the decision to delay test to January was based in the absence of a timetable? Well, the decision to delay the tests in January was made by the test providers. It wasn't a decision made by the department. And at that stage, the timetable wasn't published, no. Okay. When I asked on the 2nd of September, I think it was, Clark, is that correct, um, whether uh, a costing had been calculated um, in relation to this decision, um, I was told that it had been costed, but that the figures weren't available. Um, what, what will this change to post-primary transfer cost the public purse? Okay, so any costs in relation to the operating of tests in January are a matter for the test providers. In relation to the admissions process, however, there may be costs associated with operating a shorter process. The costs, should they arise, are being scoped. At present, the areas where additional costs may be incurred are around four key areas, and I can ask Dale to come in on some more detail if you require it. The development of the online portal for school applications, not just for now, but for future years benefit. A new approach to handling special circumstances applications within the process. The admissions appeals process and the transfer of information from the test providers to the education authority. There may also be costs around um, appeals tribunal panel members that we would need to consider. Um, and the Education Authority, while we had a number of appeals lodged last year, we need to figure out how many there may be if there is an increase in appeals this year. So there are a number of areas where costs might arise, and I know at the last committee where this was asked, there were some indicative costs that had been produced. Since then, though, we've now had an accelerated timescale from the Education Authority, and we still need the space and time to scope out those costs um, it would be unfair of me, and I think if I was to give any indicative costs at this stage, which I do not have in the department, I would be misleading the committee, and I don't want to do that. I think we need the space and time now to work out which of those four areas, how much that will cost, and, and we need to see where the best value for money lies in terms of getting a streamlined process 
which we do every year. We always okay. look at the process okay. Okay. the future streamlining if, it. If, so. the answer, if the answer is no, just tell me no, because we're wasting time otherwise here. Um, I, however, I find it quite strange that the Minister of Education has decided to truncate the post-primary transfer process without any costs available. The costs associated with a later admissions process uh, as a result of the test providers moving the date to te their test to January wasn't the Minister's decision. However, in order to ensure that Transfer 21 can operate successfully, for every child, additional costs may be unavoidable. Okay. Um, according to the equality screening document on the Department of Education's website, the Minister is considering the use of Article 101 of the Education and Libraries NI Order 1986 to direct the Education Authority to delay the commencement of post-primary transfer processes for 2020-21 until March 2021. This is obviously a wide-ranging power that the Department has previously rarely used. It has not, to our knowledge, ever been tested in the courts. Can the Department confirm if the Minister is indeed using Article 101 and why is it felt to be necessary to compel the Education Authority in this regard? Um, yeah, <clears throat> Chair, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, th that work was undertaken on the basis that uh, whilst the Department issues the timetable every year, um, it is provided to us by the Education Authority who have statutory responsibility for delivering it, uh, delivering the admissions process. So um, th this was in case we were faced with a position where we had to direct, the Minister had to direct the Education Authority to operate a timetable that would, um, that would uh, uh, would allow um, all children um, to make use of test results and whatever and be placed by the start of term. In reality, uh, this does not look like it's going to be required because, uh, as Janice has explained, the Education Authority has provided a draft um, timetable to us that's under consideration and, and that timetable does reflect the realities on the ground, so it, it would appear that that direction is not going to be required. Okay, but in, in the context of Janice's description of a of a process that is being widely steered by AQA and PPTC the minister of of education was considering the use of article 101 to direct this process yeah that would be correct and, and while it's been while it had to be under consideration chair it's not needed okay um if the public health situation changes and there are any further lockdowns, either in individual schools or localities for the whole of Northern Ireland, what contingency plan has the Education Authority and the Department put in place in order to manage post-primary transfer? Okay, so in the event of a future lockdown or anything that would result in cancellation of the test, so any decision to cancel the test will be a matter for the test providers. Um, which should, as you rightly say, be based on PHA and wider medical advice. Um, in terms of admissions criteria, however, is where we need to put that consideration on the part of boards of governors. So admissions criteria are a matter for individual boards of governors, and those schools that are using academic selection in their admissions criteria will need to carefully consider the circumstances that may arise in relation to admissions 21 in light of the COVID-19 situation. The circumstances could arise, for example, that test scores are not available for schools to apply their usual admissions criteria. Equally, circumstances could arise where a proportion of the intake is unable to take tests for whatever reason, and some applicants have a test score on an application and some applicants don't. Those boards of governors would need to conceive of each potential eventuality and ensure that their admissions criteria are robust and thoroughly constructed to ensure they can be applied in all circumstances. Each autumn, the department provides advice to schools on, among other things, their admissions criteria, and the department will shortly be communicating the information to boards of governors of schools. Okay. Specifically, I, that will be I'm, used in academic Thank you, extension. sorry. I'm almost out of my time. Can I ask what contacts the Department of Education and Education Authority <laughs> have had with post-primary schools, primary schools, parents and children in order to determine what they want to do in 2020-21 in respect of post-primary transfer. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> Chair, I suppose, Chair, what I can say is we know that from our previous engagement with, with parents and schools that having a digital, you know, an online application process is very welcome. So 
we know that that approach um, will be welcomed by parents and, and that's currently what we're looking at to try and digitise as much of the process as possible. So there has been engagement in the past with parents and schools around that part of the pro process. Okay. Uh, this committee has conducted online engagement that has received 8,500 responses from parents, a mix of parents, teachers and children and young people. Um, and we'll report on that um, in due course and bring that to the Assembly Chamber, hopefully, in, in due course as well. My final, final point in question, Janice, is you say that um, the proposal to delay tests until January has not been met with universal approval. In my experience, it's been met with almost universal uh, rejection. Um, is the Minister determined that the tests will be delayed and take place in January 2021? Chair, I can answer that one. Um, that's not really a decision for the Minister. I mean, he's made it clear that these are decisions for the providers, and our role is then to make sure that the timetable fits with that. I, I'm, I'm not finding that response adequate. You, the Minister was considering an Article 101 to direct this transfer process, so that it's not my responsibility is not going to cut it. But I am out of time. Thanks very much indeed for your answers. Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everybody, for attending today again. Um, the Chair has asked most of my questions, so I just want to come back on some of them. Uh, particularly around the engagement that has happened. Um, by answering the questions there, that you have, you have highlighted that the responsibility clearly goes back to the Board of Governors in relation to criteria to managing this whole process in terms of the public health. If it changes, if tests don't happen or if a small amount, all goes back to them. Can I ask, um, Dale did say that there was engagement in the past. What level of ongoing engagement and support will be provided to board, boards of governors aside from updated leaflets or documents on criteria? Um, Karen, I suppose from our perspective at the minute, we're, we're currently you know, in a pretty intense planning cycle to look at um, the various areas. The, as John has outlined, there's four areas. There's the online application. Um, transfer of test results, there's the special circumstances and appeals. So as as that starts to evolve and we start to come up with options, we will always be trying to engage with school leaders and, and probably the broader public at that stage as well around some of those options. But until we actually bottom some of those out, we're not in a position to engage with people. We want to have something meaningful to actually engage with them on. Yeah, because I suppose there's obviously a very um, high level of workload on principals and board of governors at the minute with um, the ongoing issues that's there in relation to keeping our schools and staff and pupils safe on top of this and to have the responsibility of this and I would know even in my own city there's division within boards of governors in relation to whether tests should continue or not so there would need to be obviously that level of support um, Janice, just really, uh, the one would be, again, you, you've sort of answered some of it there through the chair, but does the department um, have a real uh, picture of the level of oversubscription that may happen in some schools if the transfer test does not take place? Every year, Karen, we deal with um, oversubscription in schools. And yeah. as I explained at the outset, and Scott can certainly come in with the detail, we know there's two things here. There's oversubscription in individual schools, and there's also the increased cohort that we know is coming this year eight. And we've experienced an increased cohort in the past two years and a further slight reduction of 61 pupils on the cohort this year but it's still much increased as it would have been in 2015 or 2016. So in advance of that, uh, we undertook extensive planning at a very low level of geography in Northern Ireland to anticipate where the pressure points might be. And we have, as we've done in the past two years, we allocated additional places um, for intake this September, but also next September in 2021. 361 additional places across 21 schools. Scott, do you want to give some more detail on that? <coughs> yeah, <coughs> excuse me. We, we, um, uh, the issue first arose in, um, or we first did this in 2019, where we put in an excess of 
400 additional places. And then when temporary variations kicked in, that led to over 1,000 additional year eight places. Um, in the year gone past, we put in 443 before the procedure started. And again, we've ended up with over 1,000 additional places. And next year, uh, across the 21 schools, it'll be 361. And, and, and the difference in numbers, when we look at it, we look at it by region and locality and by sector. So um, whilst the numbers across the piece are broadly similar, the pressures in individual areas are such that um, we, we felt we didn't need to put in quite as many places. But um, whenever the uh, you know whenever the process is up and running, we can approve additional places by a temporary variation. And, and just one additional point to make here is that um, when we look at where we need to put additional places, we look at four sectors of schools. We look at denominational schools, non-denominational, integrated and Irish medium. Um, so. If, 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 for example, there was additional pressure in a grammar school because perhaps a, a test was taken away, if that grammar school is normally oversubscribed um, and there's available places in the non-grammar sector, the, the assumption will be there'll still be places in the non-grammar sector. And so just, you know, just because first preference applications rise at a particular school doesn't equate to mean that more children will get into that school. It depends on the availability of places in the wider area. Yeah, and I suppose that's what I was just looking for, for was assurances that if the test didn't take place, that the places would, more of the places would go to the grammar and the non-selective would again be, be penalised. Mm. Janice, you know that that happened before in my city, and I, I suppose I'd had a comedy. So it's just getting that reassurance that if the test test doesn't take place, we're clear on how the places are going to be allocated. But thank you, you, you answered that. Chair, that's me. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Car Carmen. It would be useful for us as a committee to request a breakdown of oversubscription in selective and non-selective schools and a breakdown of where additional places are given. Yeah. Yeah, Mark, is that that's something yeah, we yeah. can request? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Chair, sure. uh, thank you, Janice and her team uh, for appearing uh, uh, with us today. Um, my, my my question, or I suppose there's two questions within it, are, are really quite stro straightforward, uh, Chair. Um, and Janice, you did refer to the the fact that the school is responsible for its uh, own criteria, admission criteria. Um, recent experience um, ha has, uh, and I'll maybe just without mentioning the school, I'll, I'll talk about the experience, where I added appeal and uh, when we arrived at the appeal, um, uh, I was confused as to the exact criteria. Um, the parent was confused. The school didn't turn up at the appeal. And indeed, I, I can only take what I read out of the uh, uh, appeals panel that they were not quite clear on the criteria uh, as well. The, the, Appeal was adjourned, and uh, it was adjourned uh, uh, with the intentions of asking the school to attend. Um, and then the appeal being uh, heard again, the school did not attend. In a situation such as that, um, which uh, I'm not sure how unique that situation is, uh, I got the impression that it may not have been unique. But is there not an onus for some sort of screening of the criteria, or at least advice on the criteria? Uh, and is there not an onus on the school to actually turn up at an appeal? I think that's it, Jonathan. Thank you. OK, thank you, Robin. Um, can I take the advice and guidance first? So the department produced advice and guidance um, to all schools in terms of uh, and to boards of governors in terms of a circular which details what they should do around admissions criteria. Um, we don't specifically recommend what to use, but we do specifically guard against certain 
types of uh, admissions criteria and I'm happy that Scott can come in with more detail on that but we do provide that advice out to boards of governors. In terms of the admissions appeal question I'm, I'm going to ask Dale to come in there because they are conducted through the education authority so if I could ask Scott to come in first on the advice and guidance. Um, yeah, on, on the advice and guidance, we, we publish advice, um, uh, including on admissions criteria, and, and schools legally have to have regard to that guidance. And indeed, schools, if you're a controlled school, uh, you need to have regard to any guidance issued by the Education Authority, and if you're Catholic, maintained from CCMS. Um, so, so we do provide that advice. I, I will touch very briefly on, on appeals before I hand over to Dale. Um, uh, and uh, just to say that uh, from a department's perspective, we receive um, a report every year on the outcome of the appeals from the Education Authority, and we use that to monitor how, essentially how schools are performing. And if we see, we, we accept that there will be cases that appeals will be lost on occasion, but if we see a recurring pattern or if we see too many appeals being lost, we will raise that issue with the school because it's, it, it, you know, we can't have a position where um, you have children who should be getting into a school, but because they didn't appeal, didn't get in. So we follow that up with individual schools. I mean, I, I, you know, I would think whilst we uh, can compel, don't compel schools to go to appeals <coughs> panels, it, it really would be good practice. And if schools were to lose appeals, that would come to our attention. And we do follow it up with schools on occasion uh, where we think there is a problem that needs addressed. I mean, maybe I mean, I mean, would, uh, uh, yeah, look, I think Scott has covered that off really well. We can't compel the schools to attend. Ultimately, this is an appeal um, from the parent. Um, the panel members that we have in place are very experienced and are able to understand the admissions criteria. But, but it is an interesting point, and we can go away and consider it again. Yeah, can, I, can I just, I, I suppose the, the, you know, it's a pretty stressful situation for uh, obviously the child, but, you know, for the family uh, as a whole, it's, it's, it's stressful. But I think the, the, the remarks of the parent as we were leaving the appeal were, I didn't think I got a fair hearing. Now, that wasn't because of the panel. The panel were, I think, as expert as they could have been. But it really was that the, the school were not represented at the appeal. Uh, and a parent walking away feeling uh, disappointed on behalf of her child. Because the outcome really, in the end, was that the child didn't get into the school uh, of, of choice. I mean, Robin, I suppose, what, can, can I just pick it up on that? I think it's important to remember that that appeal is very much a technical exercise. It's very much in the space of, did the school apply its admissions criteria in the correct way? Um, I think sometimes parents perhaps feel they're going to an appeal and it's more around their own individual circumstances or special circumstances. And this appeal is very much in the space of a technical piece of work to make sure that each individual conducted the appeal. I, 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 accept, I accept exactly what, what, what you have said, um, but it really would have been, certainly from the point of view of the parent, it really would have been there for the parent to hear the answers of the school in what was, as I initially described, a, a, a confused situation as far as I was concerned in the criteria. And I anticipate, I can't say it was, uh, that indeed that the panel had a number of questions in their mind as well, but the school didn't turn up, so it was disappointing. Okay. That's it, sure, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Daniel McCrossan. Daniel Willis. He's trying to join us, maybe come back to him. Okay, let's move to uh, Just Robbie, Robbie Butler, and then we'll come back. Just okay. not there either. Half the floor, Robbie. All right. Um, thank you, guys, um, for coming on today. Um, I'll just make a statement, two brief questions. Um, I think some, a lot of stuff has already been covered, but this is obviously an issue which um, people are quite very passionate about, whether you're a young person taking the exam, whether you're a parent, guardian, whether you're a teacher from either sector, and whether you're sitting in this committee, or whether you guys will all have your, your views on this, uh, on, on AQ and, and transfer testing. But what, um, and I speak as someone who um, probably is in favour of some kind of streaming and, and testing, probably a, a better system than what we have, 
uh, as opposed to abolishing what's there. But what I find incredibly frustrating is the constant stand from under that is done with regard to responsibility uh, for making this the best that it can be. Um, I, I, because a number of questions have been asked for a period of months now, and, and one of the answers at the start um, was with regard to where the responsibility lies for different component parts of us. And I think it, it, probably the most, certainly the, the first hurdle that, that any child is going to have to um, tackle, that this could be a whole lot better. Um, and one of the things that needs to be established, I do believe, if we're going to do it properly, is that someone, and that, that person will be the minister, is to take absolute responsibility for this because, and I have to declare an interest as a, as a board of governor in a primary school, um, that, that the, the offloading of responsibility um, onto the board of governors and schools is slightly unfair when you look at the whole makeup of, of what way the education system is set up. And um, I, I just, I find it really frustrating. So it's, 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 it is directed, I suppose, at the department and, and perhaps at the minister that if, if we're going to look at this, and, and, and I do applaud him for the work that he's, he's embarking on in, in terms of the educational underachievement piece, this is a major, major uh, factor in that, um, if we're going to get the best out, uh, out of all of our pupils across the piece. So um, I just need to get it off my chest. This constant stand from under and deflecting of responsibility doesn't bode well for a system which, which gets the best and offers, uh, offers the best. Um, so I really have, I have one question and I want to ask, and it's really in and around the um, schools, mostly in the maintained sector, who have decided and very early on decided that they weren't um, going to be um, offering the test. Um, and, and forgive me if this has been asked because I had to nip out, but um, do those schools require a development proposal in, in order uh, to opt out? Okay, thank you, Robbie. Yes, in July 2020, um, 11 grammar schools in Lagan College um, announced that they would temporarily remove academic selection from their admissions criteria in response to the COVID-19 situation. The department has written to these schools and to 46 neighbouring post-primary schools and 203 feeder primary schools. It's a fact-finding and an evidence-gathering uh, exercise to ask for information as to what impact such changes would have on their respective schools. Uh, considering schools restarting in late August and an extension of time was provided then to the 18th of September for schools to respond. To date, seven of the 11 grammar schools uh, which made the announcement have responded and two neighbouring schools and four feeder primary schools out of the 203 have chosen to respond. We're currently in the process of analysing the information given that the closing date was, was the 18th of September there. So we're analysing the information and we'll make a recommendation uh, to Minister as to whether the changes are considered significant and if they are likely to have a significant effect requiring a need for those schools to submit a development proposal. Okay, um, I appreciate that. And it's, it's sort of, I suppose it's disappointing to see maybe the lack of response to the fact that you guys have written out. I'm glad to hear that you have. Um, if that's the case, and, and I take it then based on the responses, then the, the department and the A will decide um, what the uh, policy and procedures will be for those schools because it perhaps doesn't exist and isn't the best fit through the temporary variation uh, policy at the moment, or will there be something, um, I could put it, uh, unique created for those uh, schools? Well, it's for each school, regardless of whether they operate academic selection or not, it's for each school's Board of Governors to decide their admissions criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Boards of Governors have the responsibility to put admissions criteria, whatever they may be, in place. And as Scott has already said, we provide guidance to Boards of Governors um, and, and they have to have regard to that guidance. And uh, ju just to add to that, um, the temporary variation policy relates to change, changes, increases in the admissions number or enrollment number of a school. Mm -hmm. These decisions by the Board of Governors do not affect the intake numbers. No, so. no they wouldn't. Oh, okay, thank you for that. Um, just one final question, guys. This is slightly different. It's something that I've been um, lobbying for, for <laughs> since, since January, since before COVID. And, it, and it, uh, it is to bring the transfer test back to primary. And I know, very simply, you, you, you probably say, well, that's a matter for PPTC, for, for AQE, for the Board of Governors, for the respective schools. But here's the reality, guys. COVID-19 is here. 
And if we are going to res be respecters of policy and of guidance and of COVID guidance, then we need to ensure that our children are not subjected to uh, bigger bubbles or, or, or areas where they're going to be cross-contaminating uh, and so on. So um, uh, please don't do a stand from under <laughs> on this one. Uh, surely, if, if, if tests are going to go ahead this year, and I say if they're going to go ahead this year, surely someone with some authority has to give some direction, and even if there's money involved, and say we need to keep our children safe, we need to create the, the safest uh, uh, environment for them to take the tests, and also um, that their well-being will, uh, will be given primacy in this. Can I just come back very quickly, Robbie, um, and I'll ask Sam to come in in a second. So first of all, I think, you know, in terms of, of the current situation that we're in and COVID-19 guidance and the new school day guidance, the health and safety of staff and children is of paramount importance to the department and, and our colleagues and our education stakeholders. So that goes without saying. And there's currently no bar on primary schools hosting any tests. Mm -hmm. uh, so there has never been a barrier to that in the past, and there isn't a barrier there now. Sam, do you want to come in with a bit more detail? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, and you've kind of almost answered your question as, uh, to a certain extent there, Robbie. There is no bar on these schools doing this. Um, some will want to do it, others won't. Uh, and that will be a matter for individual boards of governors. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also the issue that they will then need to agree with the test providers. Uh, the current arrangements for the tests are that the tests are held in in selective post-primary post schools, so there's going to be a change to that. It'll have to be agreed with the providers as well. Yeah, and this, this, again, this, this probably highlights my point at the very start with regard to where levels of responsibility lie, and, and this is why I think there needs to be, at some stage, when, when, when we design the best process, a single owner um, of how we stream our children. So thank you, uh, Chair. Thanks, Robbie. Couple thank of you, brief guys. supplementaries, guys. Um, do you have any concern about further inequality and unfairness if there's not a universal policy in relation to where the tests are set? I think if I can come in there, just and Sam might want to come in after me, if I'm right in saying, and, and to be fair, I'm being speculative here, uh, as we've already said, some primary schools may wish to do this, some won't, which could result in some children sitting a test in their own school and other children not being afforded that opportunity. So in terms of any level of inequality, I think that that's what I would observe. Um, and, and with t no test taking place in primary school at the minute, then there, everyone's equally sitting tests in, a, in an environment which isn't their own primary school. Exactly. Sam, is there anything? Okay. Yeah, I mean, just, just to add, I, mean, I think the, the views of primary schools are as diverse as they are of parents. So th there's no easy way out of this. What, what do you mean? In, in terms of whether primary schools would be prepared to host tests, um, there, are, there is a diverse range of views out there. Some will want to do it, as Jan says, some won't. Mm -hmm. uh, and that itself could create an inequality where some children are able to sit the test in their own school, but others aren't. Right, so what's the Minister of Education and the Department of Education going to do about that? In terms of whether tests take place in primary schools or not, that I mean, the, te the test taking place is a matter for the test providers and the schools um, who wish to employ that service of having a test in order to meet admissions criteria and have scores on application forms. So the question of whether tests take place in primary schools is a matter for boards of governors of those schools and okay. uh, the test Nothing. providers. <laughs> not, not, Nothing. Uh, I, I, I find it, sorry, Chair, for jumping in. I find it frustrating that this, it, it is like a stand from under um, with regard to, because the minister has a position that he is adamant that the transfer test will go forward. And that being the case, I would support him, by the way, and I have done, so I'm, I'm not an, an abolitionist, but, but I do accept that there's issues with it. And with regard to COVID, this isn't, this isn't a normal circumstance, and I wouldn't be as vociferous. So if, I would suggest that if there's guidance from the department and EA with regard to bubbles and public safety, that that extends um, to the transfer test. Um, I know it's optional whether they do it or not. It's, sim it's similarly optional whether parents and, and, and children sit that, but the reality is, that 70 or so percent of our, our young people will sit the test. Um, and and there, our pupil safety must be paramount above everything else at this moment in time. Um, and I, I just think that the guidance that's there already um, under restart should, should similarly cover. 
the AQ testing. Yeah. Just... So is, is the minister more concerned with this test being set than how safe it is for children to sit the test? Uh, I'll move on. Absolutely I... not. Chris, can I just okay. come in there? Absolutely not. And the restart guidance haven't been involved in that myself. The new school day guidance, that applies to the school under any circumstance. Okay. So uh, okay. washing hands, hygiene, yeah. respiratory hygiene, Bubbles. keeping distance, and regular cleaning of, of multiply touched surfaces and all of those other mitigation factors that exist in that guidance would exist regardless of what's happening inside the room, whether it's a test or whether it's a lesson okay. uh, or whether it's a breakfast club. Okay, I, 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 had, I had asked you, and I need to keep us moving, I had asked you what engagement the Department of Education had had with schools in relation to um, post-primary transfer. Um, but it wasn't until Robbie asked you a question about development proposals that you divulged that um, you've written to um, a number of schools, post-primary schools and feeder schools, um, it seems, in relation to assessments of the need or otherwise of development proposals. Why, why would a, a post-primary school need a development proposal to uh, amend its admissions criteria if the responsibility and decision-making authority for admissions criteria rests solely with boards of governors of those schools? And that's what we're trying to establish, Chair. So this is around the development proposal legislation stipulates quite clearly that a significant change to a school, be that in the size of school, the management type of the school, the characteristic of the school, any significant change requires a development proposal. So this is a change which we need to explore what the impacts may be, not just on that school, but as the legislation for development proposal sets out, significant impacts on other schools. So we've had to do this fact-finding mission to gather the evidence to be able to make the, to let the department decide whether this would be a significant change. And if it is deemed a significant change, then as per the legislation, a development proposal would be required. If it's not deemed a significant change, a development proposal wouldn't be required. So the minister is potentially going to utilise development proposal legislation to interfere in the setting of admissions criteria of some post-primary schools? It would be under the development proposal legislation, Chair. It wouldn't be a matter of interfering. It would be a matter of setting out what's required in statute in terms of a significant change to a school in terms of size or character. Okay, and why is this only happening now when these uh, changes to admissions criteria were publicly announced in July? Well, we wrote out to the schools and as soon as, as practical a time as we possibly could. Well, when did you write to the schools? In, at the end of July and beginning of August. Okay, and is it possible for the committee to see that correspondence? Yes, I'm happy to forward that letter to schools, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I bring in... Is Daniel is not, not going to be there. So. Daniel's not there. Uh, Robbie's in. William, William Humphrey. William there. There he is, yeah. Yep. Go ahead, William. Go ahead, William. I think he's muted. I think he might be on mute. Um, sorry. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for your attendance. And Janice, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, Janice, so I wanted just to talk about the criterion that you mentioned. I'm, I'm a governor in two schools, and one of which is the girls' model, and I was at the Board of Governors there last night, and I want to commend the principal and senior leadership team for the tremendous work that they're doing. To hear that we have 95%, even in the midst of the COVID pandemic, the attendance rate at that school is fantastic. Um, but one of the issues you will know in working class areas and working class Protestant areas in particular is around the issue of valuing education and educational attainment and encouraging parents and, and, and pupils to, to attend school, value education and strive to do their best academically and all of that. There is a problem though, if we get to the point where we cannot get children into uh, schools. Uh, and you will know that in inner Belfast, if I can use that term, <clears throat> we have the two, the two models in North Belfast and the two Ashfields in East Belfast. But there is an issue about capacity and getting young people into schools. And this is something which comes up every year. Um, and we, we do appeal and, and push for variance. Um, we do, and we have pushed for increased facilities in terms of both models and that, and that has happened. But still of all, 
we still struggle to get the, the children into the schools that want to get into the schools. That undermines those arguments if we can't get children into the schools. Can you, can you reassure me and, and my constituents about future-proofing? And I'm obviously speaking, I've, I've mentioned East Belfast, but I'm obviously speaking in terms of North Belfast and Greater Shankill, um, part of which is in West Belfast, about getting kids into those schools, that future-proofing is being done there to, fa to facilitate uh, those young people getting into those schools because the population in all of the local primary schools across North Belfast and Greater Shankill is growing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a couple of things. I'm going to ask Scott to come in with the detail. William, thank you for the question. But yes, I mean, when I came into the department, uh, it was the first year, I think we just we just had the first year of a huge increase in the cohort. So places where we relied on the temporary variation process on a retrospective basis to be able to allocate additional places. We took last year a year forward look and it resulted last year, I think, in 213 unplaced children at the end of the process, but we did put in additional places in advance of um, the transfer process completing. This year, we've taken a two-year look at the process. So the aim would be that we would be able to look again in the following year over the next number of years to assess what, what way cohorts lie in each of those small geographical areas. But we do aim to take a future look at that. That's on the admissions side and the post-primary transfer side. In the longer term, then, uh, I have the delight of having area planning under my bailiwick as well. So that long-term strategic view is something that we aim to look at around area planning when planning for spikes and troughs in the population, ensuring that the right school places are in the right location and are of the right type to meet parental preference where possible. But I'll just ask Scott to come in on the detail in terms of additional places that have been added and the process maybe for this year that we're going <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, just very briefly, the, the, um, to cover the, the areas you mentioned there, uh, in North Belfast, there was, um, there was pressure in North Belfast over the last number of years, but uh, at the model schools, uh, I can't remember the exact number, I think there was a combined increase in 82 places via development proposal that was approved yes, just over 12 right. months ago, which um, has... Uh, as I, I think by and large address that issue, or more or less anyway. In East Belfast, again, there is a lot of pressure and across the Ashfield schools uh, this year, we put in 52 additional places before the process started. And for next year, we've put in 30 across the schools before the process started. And um, I, we have, I, I can't recall the quantum, but we have given additional places this year by way of TV um, at, at those schools in East Belfast. So. Um, uh, as I say, where those pressures arise in the short term, uh, we're able to deal with those and we would only not approve places if there were alternative schools close enough to the children's homes. But, 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 but to be honest with you, I mean, I, I'm a, an ex-pupil of the boys' model. When I was there, there were 1,250 boys and, and, and they're soon going to return to 1,250 boys, but the school wasn't built for 1,250 boys, you know, uh, and that's an indication of the success of the school success of both models. The fact that the primary schools in North Belfast are growing uh, and are, are, are pretty much at full capacity, which is great. Um, but can I just respectfully suggest that looking one or two years down the line, I think you need to be looking five to 10, Janice. And I, I don't mean that yeah. to be critical, but I just, I mean, I can see this one over the hill and that's, that, that's something that needs to be done now. We need to be looking further down the line than one or two years. Uh, and the other point I would make is, um, we, we do have those problems on an ongoing basis, and there is another acute. I mean, we're, we're talking about a divided city here. I would rather it wasn't like that. We have a divided education system. Rather, it wasn't like that, but that's the way it is. Uh, and, and the reality is that um, I mean, I'm dealing with cases now of trying to get kids into the likes of the models, and, and we come back with um, options of going to Cathy Maintain schools. If someone's living in a loyalist estate, you cannot res responsibly ask children to go to. Um, that's just the way the, the way it is, and 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 I think sometimes officials don't, don't see that, you know, sending out an offer that a child and the the family don't don't feel they can accept, um, yeah. for for safety reasons, isn't isn't addressing the problem. So I I, I think those are issues that, that the education authority, um, and the department need to look at going forward because, you know, you're right. Um, the the the, the issues weren't as big this year, but there were some. As, as previous years, 
But I do think that we need to continually work at this, otherwise those problems will come back to, to, to haunt us in future years. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I think that's something that we've always, you know, to, to, to look one, as I said, to look one year ahead was OK. To look two years ahead, I think, will prove to be successful again. And we would aim to look even further ahead with the next round. So we will definitely do that. I think um, there's something that I, there's a couple of things there just to say. I mean, the temporary variation process, as Scott mentioned at the top of the of the meeting of the session, it looks at four categories or four sectors so non-denominational denominational irish medium and integrated so when we're allocating temporary variations they are the things that we look at so it would we would never uh, if i'm right scott keep me right we would never turn down a school for a temporary variation where there are no other available places in that sector that are within reasonable travel and distance of the child's home um but you know, you make a valid point around. Yeah, but Dennis, if you if you have a child, you, you imagine how stressful, and we've all been there, some mm -hmm. more recently than others. Um, but going in first year, having been in P7 in a local primary school, you're going to for maybe having to get two buses at 11, 12 years of age, and if you add on that children who have got got potentially autistic, whatever. I mean, we've all dealt with those type of cases. Um, you know, variations are fine. But variations only work if the schools have the capacity to take the children. Yeah. And if the schools are maxed out in terms of the capacity and nothing more can be done, and that is the case with both models. Now, there's been more, and I'm very grateful as are the principals and the governors for the money that's gone into those schools. Hugely needed and, and very, very welcome. But we're now maxed out. So variances aren't going to work now. But look, I've made my point, and thank you very much for your answers, and maybe you've bear it in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, William. Catherine Kelly, MLA. Thank you, Chair, and thanks everybody for meeting with us this morning. Um, my, what I'm going to say is probably more of a comment as opposed to a question because both the Chair and Kjarn have asked most of my questions. Um, just um, as recently as 2016, the UNCRC recommended that in the North we need to abolish the practice of unregulated tests to access post-primary post education. Um, and I believe that right now in these abnormal circumstances where children have lost out on so much teaching time and are likely to do so again, that action needs to be taken. Um, this morning, um, we've seen the, the Holy Cross College in my constituency in West Tyrone has had to close its doors uh, due to an increase in cases. Um, and, you know, this is something that, that we possibly have ahead of us across both primary and post-primaries um, in the weeks ahead. Why is the department and the minister wearing blinkers um, on the issue of the transfer test? Um, an alternative method needs to be used this year especially, um, and that's in my opinion. Um, this, there should be planning taking place right now with children's well-being at the heart of it. Um, our principals ha and teachers have enough on their plates right now in keeping children safe and trying to adjust to this new normal. Um, talk about a reduced curriculum for our primary children and young people, yet there's an insistence that our primary sevens go through these tests, and to me, the main boggles. Um, also, just chair on one final point, um, going back to what the Children's Commissioner said a number of weeks ago, apply the same logic to transfer tests that was applied to other exams. Why is this not an option for our 10 and 11 year olds? Okay. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine, Sam, sorry, I'll, I'll answer that if I could. Um, there's a number of issues there. The, the first is that uh, academic selection remains on the statute book, um, and to change that would require agreement at the executive in the assembly. And why we have academic selection, um, we're going to have to test because the schools that is the school's preferred choice. The second that you asked about um, alternative methods. Um, I think the Minister's on the record saying he doesn't see anything better at this point in time. Um, there's no evidence that the primary schools would support um, the sort of assessments that happen in terms of GCSE and the A-level, and there's no evidence to suggest that the post-primary schools would accept those assessments. So there are a number of issues around there, but 
The core issue is that academic selection remains on the statute books, and for that to change, it's going to be agreement with the executive and the assembly. Thanks for that, Sam. Um, just going back to what I said in relation to the well-being of our children and young people, um, just to reiterate again the fact that we're talking here about 10 and 11 year olds um, sitting an exam and under these circumstances where there has been um, uh, you know, decisions taken to alleviate pressures of, of other cohorts of children and young people, where our youngest children and young people are actually having to still go ahead and set these exams. So to me, and it's, it's, it's in my opinion, um, I think that there should be plans put in place, especially in light of current circumstances where I mentioned Holy Cross College. This is possibly something that we will see going forward. Um, so it's just to, to reiterate the need for there to be plans put in place in case the, the, uh, the transfer tests actually don't and can't go ahead. Yeah, I think if I can just come in there, Chair, I mean, I'd said at the, at the outset um, around things that, again, boards of governors will need to be aware of in the current situation that we're in. So there may be the situation where tests have to be cancelled and there will be no score to put on an application form. Or there may be a situation where some children will have a score on their application form and some children won't for whatever reason, down to self-isolation you know, or down to school closure. In terms of the tests themselves um, and any mitigations that would take place, that's for the test providers to make a decision on as to whether they want to allocate additional time or whatever method they choose to put in place, but that is a matter for them. Um, and in terms of then, again, the current situation that we're in, in terms of the new school day guidance, there is an expectation in that guidance that if for any reason a child, a bubble of children, a, a class or whatever group of children, a series of close contacts, need to be at home for that 14 day or 10 day period depending on their circumstances that blended learning would kick in and schools are best placed to assess what additional learning young people may need now that they've returned to school. Is there anything else? Happening? Catherine, just on your issue, um, your question there about um, well-being, um, the department's working with other partners to develop a framework in and around well-being, um, so it'll take a multidisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. The minister is launching the Engage programme this morning in Dungan, I think, um, which will look at a number of areas, including one-to-one -one support for children, small group support, teacher support, uh, and that'll look at issues such as support to work through the curriculum, but also pastoral care and well-being. Thank you. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Catherine. Karen just wants to ask a supplementary. I suppose I just wanted to come on there, Sam. I know you're saying about um, it's an executive decision, but many schools have already shown leadership not to go ahead with the test, and that can be done now as well. By the other schools, um, we wouldn't put young people at 15 and 16 and do a room and test them because of a health pandemic, but we're going to do everything we can to put 10 11 year olds and do a room and test them when it's not required. Just straight ahead, Chair, thanks. Thanks, Karen. Morris Bradley. Morris, there? Yes, you should be there. Morris, you might be on mute. Yep, I am. That's you now. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. No, I, I would be in favour of uh, academic selection. I know, I know it's very contentious, but uh, I would be in favour of retaining it. But re retaining it, I think, very, very much uh, revisited and reworked. But uh, I agree with uh, previous speakers there that I, I'm not in favour of the transfer test taking place this year. And I'm wondering if the department, instead of being reactionary, to the increasing uh, level of coronavirus uh, infections across the country and what may come and what may not come. But instead of being reactionary towards that, if they could be a bit proactive and think about some other method rather than a transfer test for this year and this year only, uh, they take the pressure off teachers and pupils. I know many, many of the teachers that I've spoken to are in favour of it. So uh, is there any way of actually preparing for that eventuality, should it come? I think, as I've already said, that you know the matter of the test taking place or not taking place are a a matter for the test mm -hmm. providers, and b the admissions criteria. I referred to that again at the top of the meeting. Um, 
around what admissions criteria boards of governors choose to put in place for their schools, that these are sufficiently robust and can cope in the event that uh, some children may have test scores, some children won't, or, or no child will have a test score. So we plan to write to schools um, to ensure that there is a contingency in place in terms of their admissions criteria that will cope under that type of pressure. Okay, but I do think it's a, it's a bit of a pressure and a bit of a cop out uh, to put all the onus on the actual boards of governors to get the criteria for who they will allow into their school and who will, who will not. Uh, I think it's better that the department work with the test providers to come up with an answer now rather than later. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Morris. Everyone, Clark, yeah, I think it is. Okay, um, I'm going to be honest. I'm more concerned about how post primary transfer is going to go this year than I have been to date after this session. Um, writing to schools now for contingencies in response to some people's having scores, some of the people's not having scores, um, tests being cancelled, um, being left to test providers and schools to respond to, it seems like a huge abdication of responsibility for this particularly when a decision has been made to intervene on the administration of the process. A couple of final questions. Dale, you still there? Yep. Yep. Okay. I think you might yes, be able to. Yep. Okay. What human and financial resource pressure has the ministerial request to delay post-primary admissions to March 2021 placed on the Education Authority? Well, Chair, I think as we've referenced earlier, there is going to be a resource implication, um, both in ter terms of uh, resource and human resource, and that's really the process that we're working our way through now. Um, what we're trying to do is probably digitise as much of the process as, as, as possible. Um, we appreciate that this year is, is, we have COVID, so we want to do as much as possible to put in something that's robust but we have to then balance that in terms of risk. So look, at this stage, Chair, all I can say is we're looking at the balance between what we can digitise and what we're going to need in terms of additional human resources. But look, there, there will be additional pressure on staff with some of our processes. But until we've properly worked our way through what we can digitise, um, what's possible, that, then I can't give you an exact answer on that. So you, you can't estimate what additional human and financial resource EA is going to need to administer post-primary admissions from a delayed date of March 2021? No, well what, well, what I'm saying to you is there are going to be a variety of options that are available to us in terms of how we do this. So we, we've got four key areas. We've got the online application process, we have the transfer of test results, we have special circumstances, and we have appeals. And really, when we look at all of those, what we're trying to do is find the best way to do that, and it's a balance between digitisation and a balance between doing something manual. So at this stage, we, we haven't bottomed out in each of those areas what we intend to do and what's going to be the best option. Surely a, a minister and the Education Authority would not take a decision of this scale without having estimated the human and financial resource implications of doing so? Well, I mean, obviously we've worked with colleagues in DE and we've said that it is doable to compress the timetable. However, how we actually do that, that's the piece of work we're involved in at the minute. So do you have an estimated um, figure for the additional human and financial resource that's going to be needed for it? At this stage, Chair, we had an initial estimate, and as Janice referenced earlier on, I, I don't believe that that's an accurate figure at this stage, um, and it would be misleading of me to give you a figure. What is the initial estimate? <coughs> at this stage, Chair, I don't want to give that information. Why? Because it would be misleading. Why would it be misleading? Because the, the, the actual figure could be less or it could be more. Uh, that's why it's called an estimated figure, surely? Well, obviously, given the circumstances and once the test uh, dates had been agreed by the um, testing authority, that that means that we have to revisit that and relook at that. So I, I don't think it's appropriate here to give you that figure because it, it could be widely misleading at this stage. Yeah. Okay, I think that's 
fairly irregular to not provide the committee with the estimated additional human and financial resource of this decision. Hopefully we will get it in due course. Can I ask, um, in terms of the additional resource that the Department of Education may allocate to this uh, decision to delay post-primary admissions to March 2021, will the Department be allocating a commensurate amount of resource to ensure that any development proposals needed in response to a change in admissions criteria at other schools would be allocated as well? That's Chair, the there was one word that I just didn't pick up there. Sorry. Okay, so to re you ask me? To, yeah, to recap, okay. so uh, I work, working on the scarce information that the Department and the Education Authority are willing to disclose with regard to the additional cost of this decision to delay March 2021, will you also be willing to allocate additional resource to assist schools who take a decision to adjust their admissions criteria um, for post-primary transfer 2021? Okay. Um, the, right, sorry, your first question I mentioned development proposals there and that's what I wasn't quite sure. Okay, so let, know, let, me, let me I'll recap that again then, Janice, okay? Your, your, your additional resource is going to be required to truncate post-primary admissions 2021. I think that's a fairly sensible assumption, okay? Okay. If additional okay. resource is needed to expedite development proposals to allow schools okay. to adjust their admissions criteria, will you be allocating the same amount of resource? Okay, thank you. It's clearer now. Sorry, I just I didn't pick that up at all in the first question. Um, in terms of expedition of development proposals, I mean the development proposal time scale that's there. Uh, there are elements of it which are statutory, so uh, the pre-publication consultation phase is a statutory phase, uh, and the, the publication, stat well, after a development proposal is published, the statutory objection period is a statutory phase. So those things would require a legislative change uh, if they were going to be uh, changed in any way. The front end for development proposals, however, is the non-statutory piece, well, has, um, and has the department the, are already the... looking to... Has, has, has the minister scoped changing the timescales needed for development proposals in this uh, context, given he was willing to consider issuing an Article 101 direction to the Education Authority to change the length of time needed for post-primary admissions? Not in relation to uh, this situation, but we are already looking at an acceleration project within the Delivering Schools for the Future project under transformation to accelerate the front end of development proposals and have been for the last year. Okay. Okay. I think that's everyone, Clark. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, officials, thanks very much indeed for your time. Um, I, I must say that we're three weeks after the initial decision was taken to delay post-primary admissions to March 2021 um, and to delay tests to January. We still have no timetable, no costs, um, and it's extremely concerning. That's where we're at, at the start of end of September, start of October 2020. Uh, when will the department be able to provide the committee and indeed children and young people and families awaiting participation in these tests with those details? Well, certainly we can come back when we have costs. I'm more than happy to come back and talk you through those. I said at the top of the meeting that the timetable is imminent. We have it. We have it from the Education Authority in the last 48 hours. It's under consideration uh, by ourselves in the department, and then we'll seek ministerial clearance. So I would hope that the timetable will be out imminently. We won't delay that at all. Okay, and you're content to return to the committee when that information is available then? Yes. Okay. Thank, thanks very much indeed uh, for your uh, answering of questions today and we look forward to ongoing engagement with you on this important matter. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, Clark, do you want to summarise any actions flowing from that briefing? So, Chairperson, if I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove the witnesses and to add all the members back into the spotlight so they can um, intervene as appropriate. I'll just wait a wee minute while they do that. <coughs> I understand see our right side, so I might want to go on. Catherine. 
So, uh, Chair, if I've understood correctly, then the committee wants to write to the department seeking further information on the level of oversubscription on the additional school place allocations by sector for, let's say, 2018, 19, and 20, and indeed 21, what they have in mind, that 361 additional places for those 20 schools. Um, does the committee also want to write to the department asking for a report on appeals, uh, the numbers, the nature, and what follow-up uh, the department is actually provided in that regard, if it's a matter for boards of governors, in what respect are DE then following up when, when things aren't done uh, correctly? Uh, the committee has asked to see the letter which uh, the department has sent to schools around uh, the development, well, the possible Right, the letter that was sent to schools who have decided to temporarily set aside academic selection, sorry, post-primary transfer testing um, for this particular year, and also perhaps to ask the department for details of the timescale uh, for the change in the law, which the officials indicated is may be required if development proposals are um, required. Um, also perhaps to ask the department for details of the contingency advice that is going to be provided to schools in the event of no tests or some tests. And finally, uh, to ask for the department to provide uh, details of the, the timeline uh, for post-primary transfer and around the costs in respect of the development of the online portal, uh, the new special circumstances arrangements, the admissions appeals and the business about transfer of information to EA. Miss um, Miss Mullen. Agreed. Karen, yeah. Can I just add there in terms of cost because I was going to come in and ask, um, will the education minister be bidding for this extra funding? Because when we asked about money for anything else, it always has to be bid for from the okay. Department of Finance, or is it going to be found in house? Yep. Okay. Anything else, Chairperson? Members? Anything else, members? No. Uh, Robin? It's within what Peter has said, Chair, but I, 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 I am concerned that uh, about the professionalism of, of an appeal. They don't show up. Yeah, that, that, that is concerning, Chair, that, and I don't know how you yeah, worked no, no. out within it, Peter, but I, I, I am concerned, not only on one occasion, but, you know. I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. Well, speaking out of turn now, my understanding is that Northern Ireland Ombudsman now has responsibility for schools, wouldn't have had That's in the correct. past. So if you've gone through the process right to the end, you can then go to the Ombudsman and say things like the school didn't show up. So, But it's still a question for the department and uh, we can work that into the, the requests. So Chair, I think Mr McCrossan has joined us. Okay. Move to agenda item nine then, members. That is our oral briefing from SIA in relation to curriculum and assessment 2021. Now, refer members to your packs, which include a covering note from the clerk at page 219, the committee's response to the SIA consultation at page 225, SIA summary paper on the responses to the consultation at page 228, correspondence from SIA to the department. April 2020 on grade awarding model options and indicating that a review is to be undertaken is at page 381. Can I welcome uh, Justin Edwards, Chief Executive to the Council for the Curriculum Examination and Assessment. Clark, they're, coming they're, in. they're just coming. They're just okay. coming. And Miss Margaret Farrer, Director of Education, Council for the Curriculum uh, Examination an assessment. So we're just there. You're very welcome. Thanks. All right. Justin, Margaret, just as you're taking your seat there and making yourself uh, comfortable by way of welcome, can I say thank you for providing the committee with a copy of the feedback you received to your consultation on curriculum and assessment 2021. It seems to indicate concerns around the lack of mitigation for AS and A2, the desire for specification order, a split in opinion when it comes to optional questions, and considerable concern when it comes to GCSE English and Maths. Can I invite you to uh, take the committee through the feedback um, you've received and perhaps give us an indication as to the way forward? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to reserve, uh, return and, and discuss the matters um, in regards to 2021 and uh, the, the consultation uh, findings. And, and as your request is, um, I will uh, deal with the, the matters in, in order um, through the presentation and then happy to take any questions, of course. Um, I think that in coming to the proposals and also considering the feedback, um, we always took a, a principle-based approach to the, the proposals. Um, we are in challenging times and actually coming up with innovative alternatives had to have a principles um, on which to, to govern those. <laughs> and broadly those principles were, um, can we ensure that the examinations retain um, fairness uh, and fairness in terms of outcome of the examination? Um, the idea that we would present certainty and present uncertainty looking forward in terms of examinations for summer 2021 and looking that far afield in a, in a fluid environment around the health restrictions. Um, being conscious in the third principle about burden on young people and burden on, uh, of assessment um, and burden of the qualifications and how we address that. Um, the idea of, of safety, of awarding. Um, all qualification and qualification outcomes have to recognise when a certificate is issued, that that certificate recognises that the individual has a level of knowledge, skills and understanding. Um, and is that certificate therefore uh, safe or is that certificate sustainable over time? Um, and then the issue of flexibility. So can we build in um, that flexibility can be used with these, these qualifications? And each of those principles um, play uh, against one another so um, the more the more certainty you provide potentially the, the less flexibility you you have um, in terms of the operation or the more you ease burden the more you approach the issue of uh, sustainability of the award or, or safety of the award and i think that um, whatever whatever we we propose in terms of the outcomes um, following this uh, consultation I give certainty to the committee that seal work tirelessly uh, to implement those proposals and make sure that we're able to deliver examinations and contingency arrangements um, throughout this year and, and, and we'll engage uh, you know, respectfully um, with the committee on, on these difficult and, and challenging, challenging issues. Um, if I can turn to uh, the report and uh, take a moment to take the committee. Um, through the report, as I said, um, in the previous sessions, this was specifically looking at GCSE, AS and A-level examinations for 2021. Um, it was taking into account uh, information from school and college leaders, um, from subject experts, from teachers um, that took into account from examination officers who have an important role in ensuring that the examinations run fairly and safely. Um, but also we, we, we did seek to try and get views from employers and representative bodies because they are users of the qualifications beyond their award and higher education institutes. Um, we had proposed the range of adaptations to ensure that they could be delivered safely uh, with inside um, health arrangements, but we note that health arrangements do, do change over time, so we've tried to build in um, a leniency or a degree of flexibility with inside that. Um, that we have been able to be, in my view, more innovative around GCSE. And I think I explained to the committee before at AS and A2, there are other challenges, um, particularly in regards to the large numbers of learners who take non SEA examinations. And I had outlined to the committee before our original proposal around English and maths, which was as a key qualification for progression. In terms of response, to the consultation, 89.1% uh, of people were individuals who responded to, the, to that. And the vast majority of responses where they came from organizations were um, post-primary schools. And the vast majority of, of individuals that responded with e were either students or teachers or heads of departments. So there was a, a strong response from the education system in terms of our approach. There was very limited response um, from uh, employers um, in, in regards to this consultation, and there was response from uh, universities, uh, further education colleges, and there was response from some representative bodies as well. So we had to take into account where bodies represented a, a mass of views and also how we, how we dealt with that on individual views. 
I think that it would be fair to say that there was a, a, a strong level of agreement that we had to uh, bring about public health adaptations. Um, there was a, a consistent recognition of what we were proposing in terms of the public health adaptations. I note from the last meeting with this committee uh, last week, uh, the point made by the chairman in terms of, for example, team sports, and this is an evolving space. We have been able to make or consider amendments um, to our proposals in regards to that and taking that forward, but it is, it is, a, it is a fluid space. Um, around this, so trying to get exams set up so that learners can have certainty and working towards them has always been always been the challenge. In terms of specification order, um, there's, a, there's a willingness to engage with specification order and to understand unit content, and we will be able to do that in terms of uh, appendices and additions to our specifications to provide uh, clarity to schools for that particular order. But, but I also note, particularly from teachers' responses um, in regards to order of teaching, that teachers do value flexibility. Um, they value the opportunity to make their professional judgment about order of teaching with inside units and even between units, and, and trying to balance that is, is particularly challenging. I would always, given that we need to build flexibility into this approach, um, consider that view and, and therefore I think that um, our specification order should be at a high level and allow flexibility underneath that at, at the teacher base. I think that um, there is some request for additional support, additional materials in terms of providing and supporting um, planning uh, with inside con course content. Since um, the 20th of March, CIA has been engaged in the supported learning program um, with the Department of Education along with the Education Authority, bringing together an awful lot of materials and support materials. Um, we do have on the CIA website all our materials broken down by key stages, so it isn't just materials for teachers, it's materials for young people and materials for parents as well. We've always invested where um, we are dealing with specialist um, uh, subjects or we are dealing with information that is unique and pertinent um, to our region um, and place that on our website as well. And we've always taken a view since 2014 that that has been a digital first approach. So actually we're, we're very geared up in terms of providing that additional support and we'll continue to provide that content and materials where we possibly can. There is a balance between CIA providing that and the open market in terms of textbooks and supplies. And again, it's back to professional judgment and supply uh, from those schools. We, we, we recognize that. In terms of controlled assessment um, and, and advice on that, we actually took early decisions on controlled assessment to allow learners to bring forward controlled assessment in certain subjects so that there wasn't loss of learning between the years in support of that. So that was actually not part of the consultation because it was actions that we had already taken to support uh, that activity. Obviously, uh, as you mentioned, Chair, um, the, the matters of A-levels, there is, there is a, a agreement um, in regards to the alleviation of, of issues around health arrangements. There is a call with inside the A-level issues of more release of curriculum burden, but there we enter the, the place of safety and portability, and in the letter from the committee on the 13th of September, you reminded me of maintaining that portability as well, and the challenges of having open market and non seer qualifications. Too much um, arrangements might undermine the confidence in that qualification for portability into, for example, HE progression. Um, so we have to be mindful of how far we, we take those, those requests. I think that um, in terms of the AS point, and, and I think we did discuss this with the committee on the 13th about um, the AS grade being carried forward and the challenge of carrying forward the AS grade into the A2 environment. And we did outline that whilst we didn't feel it would be part of the amendments that we would make to the proposal, we could keep it as an open option and a contingency base should the situation deteriorate further at this point in time. But I, I believe on that basis that working forward on the, on the A2 with the number of arrangements that we have is, is probably the best in balance. Obviously, um, there was a concern, and it's noted in the, in the paper by some respondents, about that they felt that the AS was a, a lost year um, and a lost year of learning. Um, the AS contributes to the A2, and the AS specification in terms of learning does contribute to that A2. There's underpinning knowledge within inside that AS component that is important for A-level A2 um, outcomes, and, and we recognise that. I think that a lot of the comments related back to 
um, lost learning and I note today that the department has issued to schools the engage program and support for learning and I think we need to it would be my advice to differentiate between that which needs support to engage around the curriculum for extension into the A2 exam versus actually whether we change the exam uh, itself and the engage program is an important aspect of working in conjunction uh, with these proposals. I think that um, throughout this at both AS and A2 and GCSE um, there's a clear message that whatever we decide to do it, there's an urgency to ensure that we have clarity on this with inside the teaching profession and not least to give certainty to learners about how they would progress uh, in their examinations. At GCSE there was a strong agreement with the proposals of the approach of an admitted assessment. However, I think that it would be fair to say um, there's, there's some confusion between the idea of omitting an assessment to alleviate burden of assessment versus actually reducing the curriculum content in breadth. We would wish to see, and I know that the department has also written to schools, that we work towards the full content of the specification, but actually the omission of assessment alleviates assessment burden to allow us more space and flexibility for the teaching to take place to support learners, particularly disadvantaged learners who know through, through no fault of their own um, may find themselves at a disadvantage and needing more support for catch-up. So a mission of assessment plays an important role in that. <coughs> I would say to the committee that we in those proposals on GCSE admissions went further than England or Wales um, in terms of a mission and alleviating burden. Uh, and there's a balance between that because there is um, the challenge of maintaining the perception or the, the actual demand of the qualification and sustaining that forward so that learners can have confidence that that qualification can be used in future arrangements such as access to university or access to employment. But also at the same time, by alleviating that burden, we provide maximum flexibility within inside our, our system. There is um, obviously some comments around um, the challenges again of learners who through no fault of their own have, have lost learning um, in regards to playing catch up and I hope that the space used in alleviating uh, burden on assessment provides opportunity for that to be addressed. I think that the other question is, is around 40% and as you can see from the report there is agreement with 40% and some people want us to go further than 40% and some people believe that it should be less. In, in broad terms, um, going further than 40% causes challenges because we enter the space of GCSE short course and therefore we're in the place of, of recognition of the qualification and, and going to a lesser degree actually doesn't give us the flexibility so that we have um, an even approach to qualifications overarching and, and um, I welcome on to the, the factor of, of languages um, which did have one of the challenges in the feedback here as did religious studies and of course we're taking that feedback on board and looking at if we can apply the same emission approach uh, to those subjects in our proposals so that we alleviate burden in those and we don't call into subject uh, issues. There is, um, there was some calls for us to consider centre assessment grades um, and whether the sentence assessment grades could be used uh, towards the contribution in the overall GCSE outcome or could be used in year 11. Obviously the consideration of that is part of a contingency and is beyond the ideas that we had in terms of proposals of running the examination. At this point, um, and I think it overlaps with the English and mathematics, um, there was uh, some uh, comments around whether admissions in all subjects were available for all types of students and as I said before we are making amendments to some of those subjects in order to address that particular issue. I think that then we move on to GCSE English language and mathematics um, and this is possibly one of the most challenging issues that we face. In the proposals we set out that GCSE English language and mathematics was a key subject to facilitate progression. It's a key subject um, that allows access to other subjects, not just at levels but also, also laterally. It forms part of statutory curriculum development in terms of literacy and numeracy and progression for that and is a, is a key entitlement um, to learners as they progress through their years of, of schooling. But uh, you can see from the responses there that there was a, an overwhelming support 
um, for taking the admission approach or taking a reduced burden approach in regards to English language and mathematics. Um, this is possible. This is possible to do. I think that the, the question then is if it's possible, is the opportunity used then to develop um, learners' approaches in English language and mathematics through the Engage program um, and to ensure that learners are able to catch up. But there are challenges if you do, if you do this also. Um, the, in the mathematics, it would involve omitting lower, um, lower tier units. And do those lower tier units provide opportunity, particularly for disadvantaged children who are considering um, and building confidence in mathematics? Does it, does it negate an opportunity for them to participate? But on, on balance, I think that the, the overwhelming support and the consultation feedback is, is to move towards an omitted base approach in those, in those subjects and omitting the M1 to M4 in the mathematics um, and changing the, the, the speaking and listening component um, with inside the English, which you know, we, we recognise we have to listen to, um, but it, it's not without challenges for the future for those young people as well. Um, I, I did admit in that feedback, um, obviously we asked the question around optionality and it comes up in the equality section and it comes up in other sections in the feedback that actually optionality could, and we, we had picked this up previously in, in research components, optionality could have a bearing on the ability for particularly lower attainment learners to access question items faced with new question formats <coughs> or new approaches to sample assessment instruments. Um, we wouldn't want to disadvantage them um, through lack of understanding in terms of the pathway. So we think that there is a, whilst optionality did appear from some subjects in some areas, in a balanced position, we think that there is an educational argument at the moment to remain um, on the basis of admission. It provides more clarity, particularly for disadvantaged units, uh, students, rather than um, progressing on the basis of optionality in some papers and having to rewrite sample assessment instruments and rewrite specification content at this point. So on balance, we, we took that in regards to the equality position. The other, the other point that came up in equality is, is loss of learning. And I think one of the challenges on, on loss of learning is, um, is, it, is it a matter that can, other than the emissions and the burden reductions that we've proposed, is it a matter that can be fully addressed um, I think that the Engage program and support for learning also has to address and use the opportunity of the omission in burden of assessment to provide space for learners to catch up on learning that may have been lost during lockdown or may have been disrupted through no fault of their own during lockdown and brought forward uh, into this year wherever, wherever possible. And then that maintains the balance between flexibility, certainty and safety of award while also given opportunity for, for fairness. So I think that there are parts of the responses that go beyond the scope of examinations and actually deal with other issues. I think that this committee has recognised or, or um, addressed um, with other parties um, before now. Hopefully, Mr Chairman, that a lengthy introduction, but hopefully it gives a sense of uh, the, the feedback and, and where we see the areas of issue or concern. OK, thank you, Justin. Um, can I, I start by briefly just uh, following up some of our questions with regards to um, grades for 2020? Um, just a matter that we, we wanted to follow up before we get into substantive questions with regards to 2021. Um, the grade model recommendations um, which SIA made to the Minister on the 5th of April 2020, um, it, it, since then it, it's our understanding the Minister Further to those recommendations, directed SIA to adopt um, revised models using uh, Article 101 on the 12th of May 2020. Do you, that's a fairly um, unused approach by ministers. Do you know why um, the minister directed SIA to adopt a particular model with the use of our Article 101 on the 12th of May 2020? I, I can't comment on the choice of legislative instruments um, used by the model, but I, I would say that um, in the education order under Section 74, um, where, where SEER is cited, actually in, in the header broadly, it requires SEER to deliver examinations. 
It's not a point of qualifications, so if there are no examinations, then SIA can't deliver those, those examinations. Um, so I would assume that um, we have been directed beyond our remit in regards to that article. Um, the instruments to be chosen or, or used are therefore down to the department and the, and the minister in terms of that direction. Okay, maybe something for us to return to. And can I also ask then, it's my recollection that at the committee, Education Committee on the 3rd of June, you were unable to tell us what revised grading models that were going to be used, despite it seems the Minister having directed this on May 2020. Can you um, say a bit more as to why it wasn't possible at that time to advise the models that the Minister had directed for use? Um, the, the, the Minister's broad direction was to use teacher judgment in combination with statistical standardisation. There were some variations between the A-level, AS and GCSE um, qualification components, but obviously the models then are featured with inside the statistical standardisation, so it was, it was for us to work out how best to, excuse me, Chairman, how best to approach the statistical standardisation. Those models with inside that component were then in development. Okay, as I said, maybe something for us to return to, but conscious of the urgent uh, matter before us in terms of uh, 2021. Um, so, um, in terms of some of the, the key issues that have been raised, um, in terms of specification order, um, the report states that there were a large number of respondents who agreed that SIA should provide a detailed plan for teaching including the order in which units are to be taught and the recommended associated teaching times for each unit. It was agreed this would be particularly useful for subjects which may retain full course contact, content, for example, maths and English. Um, what is your guidance going to be in relation to specification order? Um, in terms of specification order, and we, we have taken that feedback on board, and I'll, I'll allow Margaret to talk about how we will we will add into that. Um, it, it's specification order, as you say, in terms of a unit or broad approach. In terms of teaching hours, where we noted it, it was part of the feedback, broadly the teaching hours are for a GCSE are 120 guided learning hours with the ability to go um, above or beyond that. There were a large, there was a large voice with inside the feedback that comes back to professional judgment and opinion about how many hours, and to get into too much detailed specificity around individual items of taught program about the number of hours that should should actually deny that professional judgment, particularly when you're dealing with differentiation and learners and learners' ability, and you're also trying to understand how you might catch up from any potential lost learning. To go into that detail, I think, would fragment and, and disrupt the idea of the other feedback within inside that, that content that learners want, uh, teachers also want to have the choice because they understand learners' progression the best. But I'll let Margaret pick up in terms of specification within inside units. Mm. If, if I may then add to that, so um, I think we've got all our spe specification addendums ready to go um, once a decision is made on, on 2021 um, and, and for every subject we have indeed um, listed the unit order. So we're trying to be as helpful to schools um, as we can without um, kind of enforcing a structure upon them because they do want that flexibility. Um, they have been teaching these qualifications, um, you know, last academic year, so it would be wrong for us to dictate exactly how um, they should teach them. But I would certainly say, um, based on the discussions I've been having recently with principals, they are keen to know the order of the units in case there is further disruption. Um, so we're certainly keen to help them with that. Okay. And on the issue of... Uh, GCSE English and Maths, the vast majority of consultation respondents were concerned with students being assessed on all elements of GCSE Mathematics and GCSE English Language. Can you speak more to uh, the potential way forward in relation to that matter? Um, I'll hand over to Margaret in a second. I think it had outlined in the opening presentation there that the emission approach had been considered in regards to reduction in unit, and you see in the feedback from some of the consultees um, that they believe that a mission approach could be applied. In mathematics, it would be it would be possible 
to use units M5 to M8 and still cover the assessment objectives. Uh, with inside the mathematics component, it would reduce assessment burden on learners. Um, but that assessment burden reduction should be used, in my view, then to catch up on the teaching and support learners in achieving that. Um, there are counter concerns to then um, implementing that. Um, I note that some representative bodies were in favour of us, principal representative bodies, in favour of us returning the full. Um, and actually one of the universities wrote to us and explicitly um, said that uh, would wish to see the retention of the full assessment. So moving to an omission unit does require a lot of trust within inside the broader approach that we will progress towards those learning outcomes and learners still will be able to achieve the overall assessment objectives. And there are challenges as well for learners, as I said before, who are maybe disadvantaged or lower attainment in terms of um, some of those um, M1 or M2 provides opportunities for learners to engage in mathematics through <coughs> assessment um, and feel and build confidence towards. But I'll let Margaret talk on, on, on further subjects. Um, yes, OK. Um, so on English and maths, I think, um, uh, you know, our initial proposals did include the omission of, of units for, for English and maths. And I think that was really to reflect the feedback that we'd had um, from principals in June. Um, because our qualifications can be taught um, in a modular or linear fashion, um, we, we do have a large number of students who have taken those two very important qualifications um, in a modular um, way. Um, and in our guidance issued back in April or May time, um, it was felt important to enable those students um, to have uh, an approach to assessment that would enable them not to be assessed on those units that they had planned to take in summer 2020. And I think it's because of this difficulty that we have here in Northern Ireland that we've got this dual approach running that you can take those qualifications in a linear or modular fashion. Um, so in Wales, everybody takes those two important qualifications in a linear fashion, so it is different there. Um, the principals, um, I think, were concerned with the, with the proposals that went to consultation uh, with the idea that those two qualifications then would be assessed at the end of 2021. So I think that's completely understandable. I think everyone recognises the importance of, of English and maths. Um, however, I think we do have to acknowledge the feedback um, that we've received through the public um, consultation um, and take into account the comments that have been made that some learners might really struggle um, to take those two important qualifications in a linear fashion in 2021 when you think about all the disruption schools are managing at the moment. So it, it is a really difficult decision. So uh, we've gone through lots of uh, reviews um, and, and, and there are bodies and, and groups, as Justin mentioned, who do think English and maths um, should be taken in full. But I think our proposal, um, which does ensure that all the assessment objectives are covered, um, that there is that principle that um, schools and teachers have told us they would continue to teach um, all of the English and maths, but they would really appreciate um, that reduction in assessment burden so that the time that they would ordinarily spend helping students practice for the exam, they can actually put to better use um, to focus on the important teaching and learning. Okay, and a uh, clear feedback is also that CA need to take into consideration the impact of home-based uh, learning can have had on some pupils and indeed um, the impact of uh, saying pupils completing um, full course content in these circumstances as well. Another clear piece of feedback was that the majority of respondents noted that the consultation was carried out far too late and it would have been a lot more useful to have completed the process earlier and ahead of school starting. How do you respond to that? I think that um, it has taken time in order to engage on these matters. Um, I noticed you know, in, in Wales there wasn't a public consultation, but our approach was really to get feedback, to get it right. 
I think over that time we've seen schools restart, which has actually given us more evidence and more information, and actually conducting the consultation at the time of restart gave us a sense around some of the subjects and whether they were possible. So our amendments to example for sports science come about on the back of developments in terms of the health environment and, and consistency and providing that certainty. We're keen, obviously, to get the answers um, out in terms of the proposals right away and critically, but actually taking this time has allowed us to make further amendments, further adjustments and innovative approaches in terms of emission and benefiting from unitisation um, while engaging with teachers throughout the process. So it's a, it's a balance between um, the, the time taken to consider all those factors and getting it right um, versus rushing ahead and, and actually providing solutions that, that may not bear the test of time. Okay, and one other clear piece of feedback was that um, you need to listen to teachers and that schools will require significant, significant guidance and support to navigate this academic year. How, how would you be meeting those aims? So through the uh, process, as I mentioned in the last meeting, I think we engaged with over 300 practitioners um, in developing up uh, the options at a subject level. So the choices that we've made at subject level aren't just uniform across all subjects because subject practitioners have been able to give in invites and feedback. And we did, as time developed, have to differentiate from some of that feedback, um, trying to build in some consistency here across subjects as well through to the full consultation. And the point of the full consultation, as the information shows, is a high level of participation, particularly from post-primary teachers, so that their voice can actually be heard through this process, again, getting it right. So it's a very open um, and, and transparent approach in terms of uh, receiving that feedba feedback and being able to act on it. I recognise that the support is needed. Um, as Margaret already said, we have developed up um, approaches and materials. Uh, we also have subject officers who can guide through schools at a subject level through the amendments and approaches that we will take. We'll also be able to provide advice to examination officers in terms of entries and changes that they may need to make uh, as well. And schools will also engage with each other um, through programs to understand how they're approaching the teaching of units and how they differentiate in that, and that's good professional practice. Okay, thank you. Can I bring in uh, Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Justin Mark, for attending this week again and providing um, that update. I think it clears a lot up for myself and gives me a greater understanding. And just a note, welcome. Um, the, you know, you, the update there you were giving us around the flexibility um, the, that you have taken that on board. You have listened to principals and practitioners. Um, and uh, very much, I suppose, I'm, I'm starting to see that now coming through. So for us, I suppose we would like to see that approach continue um, and ask that, and, and also that the flexibility would continue. We don't know whether we're going under further lockdowns. We're seeing the situation changing even this week. Um, so I just wanted to ask, um, is, there, is, that, is there going to be options there to keep rev reviewing um, coming back and also contingency plans in case we do have further lockdowns? I think that um, obviously in the proposals that we set out, we tried to set out as much as we could in terms of emission and adjustment at this early stage. The concept behind that was to provide as much certainty as we could to learners as they mm -hmm. take forward their journey throughout this academic year. Yeah. I think that um, too much interim change could only lead to disruption of that, that learning, so we have to be careful about how much further flexibility we apply and when we apply it, and it has to be done in a, in a delicate and balanced approach. That's not to say that we wouldn't rule out other interactions because we are in a fluid environment and we have to, we have to consider that, but I think we would do it with, with caution. I think that in terms of broader contingencies, we are now exploring um, other and broader contingencies, um, such as the event that examinations could not take place. Um, and we've, we've started that work and exploring that work with technical colleagues uh, to understand how we might ap approach that um, so that we have other options available to us should that situation arise. And of course, that, that needs done quickly because we are, again, in an emerging and fluid situation uh, at this point in time. But I think we need to do that work carefully and at the moment focus on um, the aspiration of the examinations with these, these amendments uh, as they apply. Um, there is... We, we are, I think it would be fair to say, at some of the limits of what we can do in terms of GCSE. Um, the, the emission approach is, is quite advanced and 
quite innovative in its approach in alleviating burden. Um, to go much further, then comes back to the issue of safety of conduct, uh, safe exams, as in terms of recognition of knowledge, skills, and understanding. I think in, in A level, there is a balance of how much change you'd make around kind of comparability across jurisdictions and, and, and access to those. But again, we just need to talk to partners um, to understand where they sit on that. I don't know if not. Mm, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I think um, you're absolutely right, Karen. We need to stay um, in touch with teachers and, and principals, and we're very keen to do that. So, um, so we have got set up some subject sessions um, once the announcement is made, um, so that we can hear back from from subject colleagues what they think of the proposals, and we're absolutely open to doing anything we can to further support. But there, there is this delicate balancing act in that every change that we make um, uh, in a very sort of short time frame can lead to other problems that are not foreseen or that we don't have time to trial. Um, and I think even with the proposals that we issued for consultation, I think you can read from the feedback that um, you know, people can be concerned about changes because of the impact they can have. So I think, I think um, it's important that we do as much as we can now and try to ensure that those changes are implemented safely um, from a technical perspective. Um, but we have started conversations, as Justin said, with um, principal groups about what else could we do um, to manage further disruption. Uh, but I think we need to do that in a way that is properly <coughs> planned. So we've certainly had some really good feedback from them on, on what they would like. Um, and it's, I think it's fair to say it's quite mixed. So that's an, yeah. And it's, it's, it's trying to get that balance in it because, as you said, people want certainty as well, students yeah. particularly, um, and principals and teachers. And that's what I was going to ask, Margaret. You were saying that principals and that are keen to know um, uh, what is there a date that, um, that this will go out? We have um, we've provided feedback to the Department of Education. Right. We received um, a number of questions of clarification. We will be answering those very quickly um, because we, we have also provided feedback that we recognise from this consultation but also our engagement with the system that clarity is needed quickly. Um, and that clarity, yes, it needs to have kind of refined. It needs to have the refined detailed on it. But in order to provide certainty to young people, to teachers, to schools, to parents, um, we 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 would welcome um, decisions on some of these items so that we can proceed. Great. Um, just my final on chair, and it has already been touched up. The feedback provided um, notes with regard to the equality impacts that children from poor, from poor socioeconomic backgrounds were disadvantaged greatly following the school closures with the lack of appropriate access to IT equipment and also for it also notes in relation to um, being concerned around children with special education needs and asking for extra support. I know that when you were given the update here um, you, you talked about um, alleviating burden of assessment uh, and you also re referred the Engage programme. Do you feel that that's enough, or is there other measures that you will be putting in place? I think, from an examinations point of view, and I come back to the point of what we can do, um, alleviating burden on assessment provides space for teaching and learning to take place, and that space I think should be used to support those learners that we've been identified as maybe disadvantaged through no fault of their their own. Um, and, and therefore you know, welcome the, the Engage program works in, in parallel with that. Um, I think that in terms of some of the adjustments we made and, and take the point about um, special education needs learners and the idea of admission and disrupting qualifications, again, by trying to provide certainty with inside the assessment instruments that we provide, that allows teachers to work with confidence of those young people so that they, they understand how that would progress through disrupting and having different exam papers might might cause other issues in that. So we've certainly taken those two factors back from the, the equality feedback. Yep. Great. Thank you very much, Chair. That's me. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Uh, can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA? And Daniel, before you start, can I send our sincere best wishes on behalf of the whole committee for a, a full and speedy recovery to you? You've been in our thoughts and we're glad to have you with us today here. Uh, Chair, thank, thank you very much. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me all right from the internet has been playing up today. You're, you're um, yeah, uh, 
I'm nearly through the worst of this, so in over a few days, and I should be back to normal. Uh, but thanks very much for your, your your well wishes from everybody as well. Uh, Justin, just to touch on a, a couple of points and just to go back to a, a number of things that I had asked uh, last week. I just want clarification of the chair did this at the beginning as well. Um, and it's in relation to, obviously, the chair has asked about the uh, ministerial directive, the uh, Article 101, uh, and you've made your comments on that. But I'm just, uh, it's my understanding that CA was already working on an alternative approach to awarding grades in the absence of exams before they were formally commissioned to do so by the Minister on the 26th of March 2020. What guidance or direction uh, had uh, you been given by the Minister before the formal commissioning and did you provide him with guidance about the way to proceed prior to the formal commission? It's, just, it's in relation to some comments made on, on page 380 of the pack. Um, through, through the Chair, uh, I, I have to go back and, and, and look at the paperwork. There's specific dates and, and directions, and I wouldn't want to get any of those wrong. But if effectively, um, we were asked for um, advice on options that could be taken. Um, we provided advice on the options. Um, we received direction um, on, what, uh, on how to proceed. Um, we proceeded on the basis of that direction and in essence as I said to the committee before the direction was on the basis of teacher professional judgment in combination with statistical standardization um, it was the high level direction in terms of models then models for statistical standardization were developed um, beyond that that direction in terms of the the option to proceed okay so so Marine then uh, just just for clarification purposes uh, that um, although you can't recall the actual uh, article that may have been used by the minister, um, that there was a, a, a that you were given general direction to use teacher judgment uh, modified by modified by a statistical model. Um, um, it, so teacher judgment in combination with statistical standardisation, um, and the yeah, the the article. Under which the chair points out, under under Article 101, um, I think that there was direction prior to that under the, the 74 um, of the education order. But yes, it was it was teacher judgment in combination with statistical standardisation. Okay, so, so I'm right in saying, just I just I'm sorry for continuing to go over this every week, but I have to get my head around this just before we move on. Um, so I'm right in saying that the model with its failings was. Therefore, your call, which is it was your direction then to the minister, is that, would that be right? The, 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 the method of statistical standardization had to be developed by SIA. Right. That just, just, this is just clarification that, that clarifies then that the minister, even though he may have used some form of direction, was doing so on the basis of advice given by SIA. Okay, right, okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, just, uh, uh, I, sorry, sorry, Daniel, if I may, Chairman, I, I didn't quite catch your point there, so I just want to make sure it's, it's accurate. Uh, I didn't hear it. Yeah, uh, just basically what I'm saying is that uh, uh, despite the direction from the Minister, and I know you can't make any, you haven't made any comment in relation to what direction may have been given, but uh, I'm right in saying that the overall model that was used was based on the advice that you'd give to the minister. Is that great? The, the, approach, um, the approach of how awarding might take place was options that were presented and assessed from um, CIA Council to the minister, so options um, were considered in how you would approach that. With inside those options, um, that had the broader range approach to alternative awarding arrangements, how you would award in the absence of examinations. The direction was teacher judgment in combination with statistical standardization. It's then for SEER to take forward that work and, and implement that. Um, so I, I think we, we have to differentiate between models and, and options. Um, models, as in statistical models, then apply to statistical standardization, which was a component of what we had to deliver. Uh, one of the principles the CA agreed, Justin, uh, with the other exam regulators to assess alternative arrangements was fairness, and it's, this is something that you and I have discussed 
uh, outside the, the committee. Uh, to quote your advice to the minister, which which I have taken from uh, the papers this week, uh, was to ensure that candidates receive fair results. Can you explain what you understand or what CA's understanding is by fair? And in, in particular, I want you to tell us, uh, do you believe that fair means that the grade awarded to the child will be in line with the standard of work the child is attaining in school? Or is it possible that the algorithm uh, under certain circumstances, for example, in centres with small entries, a situation which this country had a significant number of, could have awarded a grade quite different from it? Because I note in your advice to the Minister, Again, citing from the pack on page 385, you state that there will be, to quote, a high degree of contention and potential for reputational damage as people expect solutions at the individual level rather than system or cohort level. Can you explain this, please? And, and do you not accept that people have every right to expect that the solution should be at the individual child level? And it was not only your duty, but the duty of every exam body to deliver this in the interest of our children. Um, I'm afraid I don't have access to the papers in which you refer to, Daniel, and, and in preparation for today, I, I understood that the discussion would be on 2021 and feedback on that consultation issue, so I, I, I can't see that particular line in context, but happy to return to the committee on, on lines in context. From 2021, Justin, but this is a point of clarification based on last week's evidence session. Uh, where I was focused in on a line of questioning in relation to the advice that was received. And I'm just reading from the correspondence or information that has been provided to this committee this week for our uh, consideration that advice that you gave to the Minister uh, uh, stated that a high degree of contention and potential for reputational damage as people expect solutions at individual level rather than system or cohort level. I'm just wanting you to explain that advice for me, please. I, again, I, I don't have a copy of that paper in its full context in front of me. No, we've been provided of it and had, had a known in advance that would have prepared for that line of questioning. Um, in terms of uh, the approach that was taken, um, obviously uh, teacher judgment formed the basis of making an assessment. That teacher judgment um, was guided by the head of centre guidance, which SIA did issue on what factors should be taken into account in order to arrive at a holistic grade of judgment. The statistical standardisation process was applied in combination with that holistic judgment on the basis of teacher grade. And in terms of the direction, um, and I paraphrase the words that were used here, but fundamentally um, the idea that standards should be retained between years as far as is possible. Um, and in terms of retaining standards between years as far as is possible, given that we were introducing alternative awarding arrangements, the advice was to look at standardisation in combination with teacher judgments in order to arrive at those grades. I think you made points there about differences in um, senders and, and senders' judgments. Obviously, at the point, the, um, the head of centre guidance was very broad for centres in order to develop their approach in order to arrive at those grades um, and the information that they had at hand, given that the information would have been different uh, between senders at that particular point. Daniel, I'm, I'm going to have to move us on. So do you want to ask a brief question in relation to 2021? Yes, uh, I do, Chair. I just, and, and, and again, that was just points of clarification based on last week. Uh, just a, a brief question. Uh, CA seems to accept that the loss of teaching time due to lockdown, future local lockdowns, and individual pupil illnesses, shielding, or self isolation will need to be mitigated against. Justin, would CA also accept that the new normal in schools is already disrupting learning with such things as staggered arrival and departure times, break and lunch times, strict hygiene regimes? Should these matters not also require mitigation as school principals have advised you on? And will CA also accept that the teaching unions are correct to argue that preparatory, uh, preparatory learning for A2 was lost during lockdown and should be allowed for as well? Um, uh, in response in the opening to the committee, I did highlight that in regards to GCSE, the approach that we have taken is a mission of assessment, and the concept of a mission assessment is to alleviate assessment burden so that teachers, schools, and young people have the flexibility to use that time and space in order to mitigate any lost learning or any need for catch-up. This has to work in conjunction with the launch of the Engage program. Um, which is about supporting learners in preparing and catching up uh, for those elements. I note that um, you know, our approach in regards to A2 
with a focus on 60% assessment at the A2 rather than a reassessment with the AS also alleviates burdens for the A2 students, which again allows flexibility with inside the school taught program and the amount of hours available to them to adjust for these. We did in feature in our thinking and certainly in the feedback in pre-consultation and post-consultation, and maybe this is one of the benefits of, um, of the time that we've taken is we've understood the impact um, on schools and we believe that the alleviation of burden and assessment does provide opportunity for those schools to adapt. However, as I pointed out to the Deputy Chairperson um, as well in the previous questions, we will have to keep that under monitoring control and we will also have to consider and develop contingency arrangements because we are in a fluid circumstance. Okay, I'm going to have to move us on. Daniel, apologies, but I think detail on the scope of the Engage programme is going to be something about which the committee will seek further briefing. Can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank uh, uh, Justin and uh, Margaret for being here again. Somebody pointed out to me you're here some, maybe more times than some of the elected representatives <laughs> in the building. But anyway, that's, 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 so you're very welcome, and thank you again. Uh, Chair, could I maybe ask uh, to return to uh, points that Margaret made? Um, around the, uh, and I really only have one major concern, and my major concern was because the expression major difficulties around English and maths were, were being, being used. And, and because they are such the primary building blocks for so many other qualifications and, and careers uh, for the future, uh, and indeed that. Uh, and I, I was, I was, the clerk summed up or gave me a word last week where I was struggling to find the word, and that word is portability of, of the qualification. Uh, and it seemed really that um, we obviously need to uh, get agreement on the maths and English qualifications with the portability into the university uh, cross channel. Um, and, and indeed, that whatever our qualifications, or whatever we end up with our qualifications, you, you know, there, there's the safety of the award, the assurance of the award, um, and indeed it prevent, pre, uh, presents the young person with the maximum opportunity for career advancement through through university and so on. Could you maybe, Margaret, just talk a bit more about what those major difficulties are in getting us to a solution? Um, well, I think the the issue is, um, you know, the idea of omitting units. Um, so I think I think colleagues saw the long list of qualification subjects where we had proposed the omission of a unit. So I think um, with with English and maths, for all the reasons you've outlined, um, because they are key foundation subjects, there there is a nervousness around taking anything out. Um, because they are so important for all other subjects, working in employment, in jobs, um, and indeed, uh, you know, universities want students to be able to kind of write well and be uh, numerically able. Um, but I do think, you know, there is something to be said for, you know, balancing that with the fact that we are in the second year of a global pandemic. Um, and, and this was a difficult you know, area that we talk through with principals. Um, I think some are of the view that, you know, all of English and math should be taught and maybe could be taught in their schools. But other schools, for different reasons, perhaps because of the nature of their pupil cohort, um, think it would be very difficult for their students to complete all of English and maths in what is now a, dis a disrupted academic year. Um, so in, in terms of some engagement with the HG sector, um, so I think I may have mentioned at a previous committee that, that I had engaged with um, the higher education um, professional statutory regulatory body committee. They had a forum in which they were discussing all the challenges they were facing in terms of enabling students to um, qualify to become doctors or architects or engineers. So kind of really high risk, if you like, high stakes qualifications because these students will be free to, um, you know, fix aeroplanes, etc. 
And, and when I raise with them the, the subject of GCSE, so if we remember the GCSE is a general certificate of secondary education that you would normally complete when you are 16, um, they said that they understood um, that changes would need to be made, that the well-being of students was key in this very difficult period, um, and that so long as sufficient care and due diligence had been taken in making decisions to, to make changes, um, they were understanding of that. And they did think that you know, some form of exam would, would be better than what had happened last year, where no one was able to um, complete an exam. Um, so, you know, they, we, I also asked them uh, the point about, uh, you know, if different decisions were made in different jurisdictions because um, the lockdown situation, the health issues are different in, in different, uh, you know, areas. Um, and they, they were understanding of that. So that, I guess, is one part, but an important part of the HE sector. Um, you know, we do have um, circa 150 universities in the UK, and we do have students in Northern Ireland who wish to study um, in the South. But I think it's about working with the HE sector to encourage them to be flexible and understanding that, you know, we wouldn't ordinarily be... Um, taking out significant sections of qualifications, but we're doing this to support learners um, who are in the second year of a global pandemic. And the, the, the body you were referring to, was that a UK-wide body? Um, yes, it's the um, QAA body, which oversees all of the um, sort of quality assurance arrangements um, based in England. Um, so this body regulates all the universities, I think, across the UK. So it's a forum that was set up by that body. Uh, and uh, in terms of how far off getting an agreement, would you maybe a how long is a piece of string type question? Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I think I think the bodies, the HE bodies that were represented on that group, which are the ones that oversee the qualifications required for things like nursing or medicine, where they will specify um, requirements for GCSE or certain grades. Um, as I say, they, they were understanding. I, I think we do need to remember that the HE sector is a market. You know, it's a £13 billion industry. So GCSE grade requirements are based on supply and demand and the popularity of certain institutions, um, not always on the need for a certain qualification to be completed in full. Um, but we are also um, keen to have further discussions with UCAS um, and the Russell Group and Million Plus, who are two of the bigger representative bodies from, from the HE sector, and if we can, Universities UK, because I think it could be really helpful um, to have them express um, their intention in terms of supporting students who are taking qualifications um, in this academic year quite early on. Okay, so it's fair to describe it as a work in progress? Yes, I think so, yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robin. Uh, Robbie Butler. Thank you. Thank you um, to you both for being here again. I know your workload is quite significant at the moment. Um, I won't waste too much time, but um, certainly I join the, the Deputy Chair in, in welcoming, wel welcoming some of the discussion today, especially with regard to omission. And I think in the, in the previous discussions we've had, rightly, you're probably not committing to where we would go with regard to optionality, omission and all of those things, but it certainly it's good to see that there's, there's movement and um, through engagement it's probably been achieved. Um, with that in mind, and I've raised this in, in the past, so uh, in terms of a, a sort of equality impact assessments across a range of issues, so um, and if we look at, I know you've mentioned them verbally, both, both of you, uh, with regard to students who would find themselves you know, in, in the, what we'd know as social disadvantage. Then we have a cohort of young people whose parents were key workers and maybe had lo lost support at home, um, SEN uh, pupils. Um, but we also have the one which isn't people, it's about subjects. And it is, I think it's, as Robin said, maths and English, but in terms of inequity across subjects. So what sometimes can happen, and I'm not sure about this because I don't know behind the scenes, but I do think there is certainly a, a gender 
issue with regard to um, subjects that are taken and selected. So sometimes, in, so in terms of maybe the study time that's required to set the, the exams or the qualification that, that is coming up, um, it, has there been any? Has there been an, an opportunity for anybody to feed into or to start some impact assessments on these? I am supportive, by the way, of, of certainly what you've brought today. Um, and, and on your last point about the higher education universities, I, I, I mean, one of the universities did to, to, to just come in and say, actually, the full um, maths course must be taught to uphold that you know the value. And I'm sitting and going, well, do, do you do you know what's going on at the moment? Do you, do you understand where's your compassion? Um, what what you know? What consideration is there? Um, for not just the pupils, but the, the teachers and the staff that are trying to cram in, 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 in what is already a confined time space, which is only going to be further further constricted. So, big long statement, but equality impact assessments. Um, in, in regards to the feedback that we've taken from the consultation, obviously we've considered there's, there's inequality at subject versus e equality issues from the broad range of provision, and I think um, through the deputy chairperson, and hopefully answered the questions in regards to equality. Inequality through subjects, we recognise that, um, for example, in languages, um, there was the issue that we had full assessment um, in the languages, and of course, strong feedback come on that, and, and we do have to go away and consider a mission for balance in in um, balance between subjects and comparability. It because of subject specification and construct, it may not be possible to balance every aspect. Um, because they have different units and different constructs, but you know, I, I certainly think that the popularity of the emission approach um, and the ask for it to be considered across all subjects is something that we certainly have to take on board um, and, and do something with. We have um, considered all those in terms of an emissions balance and also considered the factors of our original proposals and considered factors of English language and, and, and screened uh, the work for equality uh, points of view. I think that we, in the, my opening statement, the balance between um, what we assess and what we teach and how we teach, we have to take into factor, and, and there is a factor of support programmes engage, um, diversification of approach to teaching and learning and support that has to be considered, and, and we don't have a lot of information or data on that because we're in a, a unique circumstance. Um, but really supporting learners so that they are able to gain the knowledge, skills and understanding to progress towards the assessment is, is critical while also alleviating the burden that assessment places to provide space for that, that to happen. In your point uh, around um, maths and English, obviously we want learners to gain the skills, knowledge and understanding in maths and English and literacy and numeracy so that they're adequately prepared whatever they do next. Um, and I come back to that point that you know, the qualification does have, have a value. Uh, does have an important value in saying that the learner does have that knowledge and skills and understanding in, in, in order to progress. And I think that, to be fair to some of those people who did comment on retaining the full burden of assessment, um, they, were, they were cautiously pointing towards ensuring that learners are ready for the next stage in, in learning and we don't create other challenges at future points as well. However, come back to Margaret's point, um, if we can alleviate burden to allow the space for the teaching and learning to take place, we should actively consider that. Um, and in regards to the mathematics, the assessment objectives would still be covered in, in the options proposed by the teachers, M5 to M8, say for example. The assessment objectives would still be covered, so this still is a broad assessment of the knowledge, skills and understanding to progress. Um, so whilst it alleviates burden, it doesn't diminish the assessment instrument. Um, with regard to the Minister's announcement today of the, the rollout of the Engage programme then, it's, I, I imagine it's going to play a really critical part, not just in the catch-up, but in terms of equipping um, and underpinning some of their already learnt, um, uh, the knowledge that, they, that they exists. Um, will, will CCA involved in any part of the Engage development and is there have there been any identified synergies and do you place much import in its role for the students that are, will be exiting exams? SIA plays an active role in the um, standards and learning part of the restart programme um, that's led by the department and in standards and learning then there is there is a, a, aspects of, of learning support which includes material support, content and advice to, to senders in conjunction with the EA but I would, I would agree with you that the application of that Engage programme is important in regards to some of the feedback fed through from qualifications, understanding, and, and the two have to exist in, in synergy.
Yeah, yeah and final one, Chair, if that's okay. Um, yeah, thanks. So, um, lessons learned from last year. So, if we, if we go for a doomsday scenario where exams are going to be pulled, um, is there is there a, a is there an idea um, or a commitment that any strategy um, that will be employed or to be deployed will be fully consulted on and will be made public um, with regard, you know, prior to its application, as opposed to the sort of the, 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 the approach from last, last time? I think that, as Margaret has outlined, we're already starting pre-engagement with particularly school principals to understand, because they have the understanding of the effects and cause of COVID and health restrictions within inside their centres, what is achievable, what lessons they are bringing forward <coughs> in terms of uh, the approach last year. And I've spoken before about statistical standardisation but actually in terms of centre judgments and the challenges that they, they face um, in terms of <laughs> centre judgments, we need to feature that in, in all our thinking and development of a, of a range of contingencies. Um, but uh, like I said, I think in terms of examinations um, and the examinations proposals, further and small changes throughout the year to those could create uncertainty for learners. So um, at this point, would like to proceed with the, the proposals, amended obviously on the basis of the consultation, proceed with those proposals to allow us space also to engage with alternative contingencies with the system. I think that's absolutely fair, Chair, I just want to finish this one out because I think you're, you're right um, in terms of the contingencies, you start with, with where we are, the contingencies need to be there, but really just asking for sort of um, that if, uh, uh, the CCA commitment would be that they would want it open and transparent in terms of what it might be with regards to that piece, so um, the design of it can happen. But a commitment that it would be just open and transparent prior to its application. That's that's really it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Members, if I could just encourage the five of us remaining to remain in order for our quorum to be met and bring Catherine Kelly in for a final question. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Chair Chair. I have one question and it's probably more for clarification on some of the points already made because there's been um, many questions asked um, that I had already noted. So um, thanks, Justin and Margaret, for again meeting with us today. Um, you've indicated that any changes in the prevalence of the virus is likely to result in the need for additional um, changes and consultation. We're already seeing the beginnings of a second wave as we approach a difficult winter. Um, and we have already seen the closure of a school in my constituency this morning due to an increase in cases. Um, interrupted learning could be a part of school life for, for young people um, for the school year ahead. So I suppose a timely and proactive approach um, right now is necessary. And I'm glad um, to hear that you're taking into consideration the feedback um, on the need to reduce maths and English content. Um, but are SEA confident in that reductions or omissions um, in units will take into consideration worst case scenarios? Um, and by worst case scenarios, I mean like if schools close or if bubbles have to, school bubbles have to isolate for 14 days. And if it's for, it's for clarification. Thank you. Um, just, just in terms of um, clarification, some of the points made there, the maths and English, we're not proposing a reduction of content, we're proposing a mission of assessment burden and alleviate burden. This is the, the strategy that we've taken all along, if we were to propose that in, in terms of that consideration. I, I, I go back to the point before that the specification in its fullness should be worked towards in the interests of young people to ensure that they are developing the skills, knowledge and understanding that the specification content um, defines, but we do take the feedback that um, could, could an approach be made in terms of maths and English that would be similar to the approach that we've taken in, in other subjects in regards to the emissions. I think that the point you made around disruption in schools, obviously with our proposals around GCSE, was to provide and provide space and alleviate burden so that further teaching and learning and catch up support and arrangements in combination with the Engage programme could ensure that learners aren't, aren't further disadvantaged by no fault of their, their own. Um, in terms of the worst case scenario, I suppose the worst case scenario is that the health restrictions become such that examinations are no longer possible 
Um, and, and at that point, as I said before, we, we have to explore um, potential contingencies for that, that scenario. Um, but at this point in time, these contingencies are to allow alleviate burden with inside the context of examinations being able to take place. Okay, Catherine, thank you. Uh, in thank you. In closing, uh, Justin and Margaret, can I ask what the timescale is for ministerial announcement on curriculum and assessment 2021? Um, as, I, as I said here, we, we've given um, information to the department. We've received some further clarification requests. We will um, be issuing that as soon as possible and actively encouraging um, uh, decisions on these factors when we, when we provide that feedback. We, we are keen, um, we are very keen um, to implement the proposals for this phase in terms of uh, examinations, operations, not least because I'm conscious that we have GCSE maths and English examinations in January. We don't just have um, summer examinations to consider here, uh, and I'm keen to give clarity and provide as much certainty as possible to young people and, and, and the learners. So we will respond to those queries that came through um, earlier this week from the department and, and seek that decisions are made as soon as possible. Okay. Justin Margaret, thank you very much indeed. Um, much. We'll remain in close contact with you um, on these matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting, Broadcasting to add all of the members back in the spotlight until the end of the meeting and ask the clerk to summarise any other actions or requests for additional information resulting from the briefing? So I think, Chairperson, members want to uh, write to see uh, just to seek a um, further clarification around the uh, broader, contingency, broader contingency planning and the timeline uh, for the production of any um, contingency plans. And additionally, then, Chair, do members want to write to see uh, just seeking clarification on, in respect of last year, uh, when the models were selected and why, when CA came to the committee on the 3rd of June, as you asked, uh, they were unable to explain what the models were uh, when it appears they may have been selected uh, in May. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. yeah, Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, totally agree with that, Chair. There's still a lot of unanswered questions, and I'm sorry for going back over the ground again today. Just there, there's uh, a lot of uncertainty around some of the actions taken by ICA, and even given some of the very hum helpful information that's been provided to us as committee members this week, uh, it's just disappointing that although we, Justin wasn't there to discuss that today, it's just disappointing he didn't even know what to say about the advice that he himself offered. Um, there's a whole heap of issues with us, and I am just fearful that they will repeat the same uh, next next year. Okay. Uh, appropriate to ask the Minister um, with regards to Will he commission an independent review, or have we asked that, Clark? We have asked that question. Okay. There is an answer. It's at page 378, okay. um, where he's indicated that um, he, the Ministry advises that he's asked officials to take forward work to set up a review of the operation of the awarding arrangements, and will make more details available to the committee as soon as possible. doesn't say independent. Okay, so the Minister... The uh, minister are we is, here, yeah, go uh, on this? Because I had written a separate question to the Minister on it and he did respond and similar to the answer that the clerk has just read out uh, and then I went back to Peter and asked him to clarify will it be independent he says he couldn't confirm over email so that tells me it's not going to be independent I don't think but we need to seek further clarification around it there is certainly going to be a review but in my opinion it absolutely needs to be independent to ensure public confidence yeah you're, and or. you're, you're right the committee has received a response to say that the department oh the Minister has asked officials to take forward work to set up a review of the operation of the awarding arrangements. Okay, um, can we return to ask if that review and indeed to suggest that review ought to be independent? Members content? Mm -hmm. Agreed? Yep. Okay, Clark. Okay, independent. Okay, very good. Do you want to move to correspondence? Okay, correspondence, agenda item seven. Um, Clark, you okay to speak to correspondence? Yeah, Chairperson, I'll be quick then, members, as we need to be out of here shortly. At page uh, 51, we have 12 items of correspondence. The summary note is at, is at page 52. Um, so I'll ask members to stay if they can. Okay, so um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so the only ones I wanted to pick out is uh, first to ask members if they are content to dispose of the correspondence as per the summary note, which is at page 52, with the following exceptions. Um, 
Uh, firstly, at page 58, we've talked about this already. This was the business plan. Um, the chairperson had picked out some of the highlights. The chair had asked about the timing for the independent review. That's at page 99. It now appears to be March. Okay. Um, when I thought I picked up from the minister that it was going to be September. Maybe I had that wrong. Um, so uh, members content just to note this for now. Um, though there are already other actions about uh, writing for information, which they previously agreed. Agreed. Lovely. And then at uh, page 102 is correspondence from a concerned individual about support for substitute teachers if they are required to self-isolate. So I'm not quite sure about this one, so I'm just wondering if the committee is content to write to DE seeking clarification on the policy around this. So would they be paid if they had to um, self-isolate? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, I think that's an important, uh, very important question uh, as well, uh, Clark, uh, and it's something that I've sought clarification from the department that I haven't received an answer to, because uh, a number of teachers have reached out to us and I'm sure other members of the committee as well uh, expressing their concern. Agreed, um, yeah. Okay, moving on then to uh, page 112. This is from the department. We chatted about this earlier, about wellbeing and physical activity. The committee's going to take a briefing on this in November. But what DE advises there is that there hasn't been an ETI survey. And I think, I'm not sure whether they've done the um, independent evaluation of the curricular sports programme. So I suggest that we just write to the department just to see ask about uh, both of those things yep. and still take yep. our briefing. Yeah, Clark, just to know very quickly, um, the 2018 school omnibus survey indicates that in post-primary schools, a key stage three, 72%, and a key stage four, 69% of pupils are getting less than two hours per week physical education. At post-16, half the pupils are getting less than two hours per week. It's fairly concerning. Okay, follow that up. Thanks, Clark. That's all I had, members, if members are content with the correspondence. Okay. Any other business? No. Okay. Next meeting, uh, Wednesday the 30th of September in room 29, Parliament Buildings. Thank you, members. Thank you. Thanks, Clark. Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29.